as members work out how various health care bills will be handled once they get to the House floor. Each bill that comes to the floor has to have a rule which establishes the parameters for debate. Among those speaking before the committee, Republican Fred Grandy of Iowa and Democrat Roy Rowland of Georgia. Chairing the committee, Democrat Joseph Moakley of Massachusetts, the session runs about two and a half hours. The uh, committee on rules will now come to order. The first matter before the panel is Senate 2182. The conference report on the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 1995. Mr. Solomon. <coughs> well, Mr. Um, Mr. Chairman, there are many things in the conference report uh, in these several hundred pages that members can support, and there are many things that members probably uh, would oppose. My chief concern is with the larger context in which this legislation is presented. Our colleagues on the Armed Services Committee have done the best they can with what they had to work with, uh, but that is the problem. They have been given so little to work with, and I am personally very much concerned about that. That's, that's why I voted against the defense authorization bill when it uh, was taken up in this House some months ago. The Clinton administration has outlined a six-year phased reduction in the defense budget that will cut some $156 billion through fiscal year 1999, oh, yeah. and that is a 35% cut in defense spending. I think that is, uh, uh, just decimates the defense budget. Uh, so far in the first two years of the Clinton six-year plan, Congress has enacted only one-tenth of the cuts that, uh, that are called for, and that means that this present legislation, inadequate though it may be, is just barely managing to, to hold that line. If we follow the Clinton plan, next year's bill will have to represent nothing less than unilateral disarmament, uh, as far as I'm concerned. And once we embark down that road, we can contemplate the dismantling of our defense industrial base. Under the present administration, this nation is headed for a foreign policy shipwreck, which should hit just about the time the impact of all these defense cuts are really being felt uh, nationwide. Uh, I'm. Uh, very happy that the conferees included my amendment concerning the North Korea nuclear program. If you recall, the committee was good enough to make my amendment in order. It was debated on the floor and passed overwhelmingly. That amendment is the only concrete expression in Congress uh, that has thus far made uh, any effort concerning this controversy. And uh, I know the papers over the weekend were trumpeted a, a supposed breakthrough in the negotiations with North Korea, but the papers today are reporting that North Korea is turning up the pressure and may be starting its current reactor after all, and that, uh, that to me is very dangerous. All of this points up the reason why we cannot ease up on a second for these negotiations. I was also extremely happy to see that the conferees included my amendment that would prohibit universities and other institutions of higher learning from receiving uh, research grants from the Defense Department if the schools deny access to their campuses by military recruiters. And Mr. Chairman, I don't have to tell you that today we depend on an all-voluntary military. Uh, in the uh, last 10 to 12 years, we've been able to really attract a cross-section of American young people, both men and women, uh, the best qualified young men and, men and women to handle the strategic weaponry that we have today. And to do that, we need to continue to have access to campuses so that we can offer to these young men and women an honorable career in our military. It's one of the most honorable careers that anyone could have. I wish I could have, uh, could have had one myself. Unfortunately, I couldn't so do that. So do I. And, uh, <laughs> which means I wouldn't be here. Is that what you're getting at, Mr. Chairman? But um, nevertheless, uh, the uh, ban is in the conference report. Uh, and uh, we'll be coming to the floor, and that's going to go a long way towards maintaining the kind of military that we need in this country. Having Mr. said all that, let's get on with the business. Uh, just, oh, maybe someone else may have something to say. That's what I meant, sir. I was just going to tell Mr. Solomon that I'd be delighted to put him in touch with a recruiter. <laughs> in fact, I'd give him my principal nomination to West Point. <laughs> well, if, you, if you made it the Naval Academy and the Marine Corps, that might be different, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bielenson? Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I wasn't proposing to say anything, but our friend Mr. Solomon has obviously got himself a new speechwriter there, and I'd suggest, Jerry, that you get another one. Talk about unilateral disarmament. 
that this country is going through when there is not an, an identifiable external military threat to this country that we cannot take care of five times over. We have, as you know well, a superb military. Nobody else in the world compares. The Soviet Union, which until three or four years ago, I see he's writing out a response here. You bet your life I am. Well, but you ought to have a little more, you, you ought to have a little more, what's, what's the word, confidence in our military and in our country. All through the Cold War, you guys thought we weren't doing enough, we weren't strong enough. Who won the Cold War? Now you're saying we're unilaterally disarming. The Soviet Union, which was the only discernible threat to us four or five years ago, is spending at about 15 or 20 percent the rate for military, for defense spending now as they were five years ago. We're spending at about 85 percent the rate we were then. We have, as you, as you would, I uh, would hope, agree, a military that's beyond compare anywhere in this world. If you spend any personal time, as I know you have, as I have, as some of the other members of this committee even have, with the U.S. military people, uh, you would know that beyond any doubt. And for anybody to suggest that even making the modest cuts in defense spending, and I don't hear anybody suggesting what other programs we should be taking the money from to put it into defense, but for anybody to suggest to the American public that we're unilaterally disarming is, it seems to me, being very, very loose with the facts and, if I may say so, irresponsible. We have, we will maintain, we will have five years from now a military that is so much stronger and so much more capable than anyone else in this world that I think it's foolishness for anybody to suggest otherwise. Well, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman to yield. Mr. Sullivan. Would the gentleman yield? Of course I will. Because the gentleman knows I have uh, great respect for him, even though he uh, has just said that I'm rather, irresponsible in my I'd statements. rather you agreed with me than uh -huh. have respect for me. Well, let me just tell you, who won the Cold War, okay? Ronald Reagan won the Cold War. There's no question about that, and the historians will show it. But you want to know where we would cut? You know, I offered, along with uh, uh, about 21 other Republicans and Democrats, a balanced budget on the floor of this body, thanks to this committee making my balanced budget in order so that we could debate it. And that showed you where the other cuts would come from, and we balanced the budget within five years. You know, you... Uh, you mentioned, you, mentioned a couple of the big programs that you'd cut. All of them across the board. We cut... Social Security, we, Medicare. No, no. Social oh, no. Security is not a federal program. It is a forced savings account so that Americans will have to save so that when they reach the age of 65, they won't become wards of the state. Mr. That, Chairman, to me, Mr. Is Chairman, I apologize for having excited program. our friend from New York. Is the gentleman going to let me finish? Is, of course you may finish. Okay. Now... You know, the reason we were so successful in Desert Storm, and I was over there three times during while all that was going on, That's why we were was so because successful. we had the peace through strength buildup, which gave our military, our young men and women, the equipment, the strategic equipment, such as uh, glasses that could see in the dark where our enemy couldn't. They had, we had such sophisticated equipment, we didn't suffer any casualties. You know what would happen if a war broke out in North Korea today, in South Korea? You know how many people we would use, lose in the first 10 days? 10,000 American soldiers, would we'd that, lose them. Would that have been any different two years ago? No, it wouldn't, but it will be that way three years from now, my friend, if we don't maintain a decent military with decent research and development to continue to give our military the kind of equipment they need and to attract the kind of young men and women that can use that equipment. Jerry, we don't argue. Enough said. Okay. Enough said, Mr. Chairman. We don't argue over what you just said. We argue whether or not the amount that's it's being made available this year is adequate. Many of us think that it is, yeah. and many including, including our friends, Republican as well as Democratic, on the Armed Forces Committee. Mr. Goss. Well, that is not true, and that's why they voted against the bill. Mr. Goss. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, I apologize for being late. The, um, the issue, I think, that has been hit is, is really the subject of the real debate. Obviously, I've walked in on it, and it's a very passionate debate because we care very much. I've been uh, looking at it from the perspective of the Haitian uh, misadventure, and uh, we really do have a problem. I mean, even with something as ridiculous as, as talking about invading a, a, uh, a friendly neighboring country uh, that has got an outstanding army of perhaps 7,000 people, uh, and the airplanes that don't fly and boats that don't float. Um, and, and yet it has tied up a tremendous amount of resources. It's going to cost us a billion dollars, I understand, to keep doing what we're doing there, to, to uh, play the end card on that policy, costing us a uh, great deal of money. And I understand uh, that it's a possibility that we are now having problems of having to make decisions about rotating troops back to state off of duty from there because they've just come in from Mogadishu the Inchon uh, force, is now coming back on a stand ship going back to Boston and so forth. They're being replaced by the WASP task force, but 
the problem is, at the same time, we've got something flaring up in Cuba, and we need to do something in the Florida Straits. Now, where are we going to get those ships? Well, now we're diverting Coast Guard cutters from missions from other areas because the Coast Guard presumably can, can do it. It, it. It's getting a little bizarre. We're spending money, and there isn't even an enemy in sight. I mean, what we're dealing with here is basically a refugee problem, uh, and we're dealing with compassionate uh, problems uh, in, um, in Rwanda that are real. I mean, we all know that. But those problems are caused by instability. The way you get stability traditionally is use some type of a, a military or law enforcement uh, mechanism. Well, that's what our military is being asked to do. And the frustration of Secretary Perry saying that, you know, we're an army, not the Salvation Army, I think is a, is a question that suggests there ought to be a policy debate about that uh, in, in the United States Congress. Uh, and I think that's a very uh, important point. Uh, we are also being asked to use what in effect are defense dollars for what are really state missions. They're diplomatic missions uh, in paying off the UN, uh, our, our assessments, and uh, dealing with the difference in those dollars. I think every one of those is a valid debating point that needs to be brought to the fore for a very simple reason. There are Americans, Americans, not just necessarily members of Congress, Americans who are generally concerned that we are stripping away our ability to defend our borders and tend to our national security needs on a global basis. Now, whether they have cause that is real or whether uh, it is not as alarming uh, as uh, they perceive it, the thought and the perception is still there. That's not deniable. Otherwise, I wouldn't be getting those letters and calls, and these are with Jerry Solomon. And I'm sure you're getting them, too. And I'd be happy to yield from the gentleman from California. Thank you. Very briefly. If I may, Mr. Chairman. I know I may not, but I'm going. Oh, go ahead. Okay, thank you. This health care stuff gets a little tiresome. I thought we'd talk about something else here for a few minutes before we get I think it's a nice diversion. I agree. You're right. But we may not have it on the floor for a while yet anyway, so might as well talk about something that will be on the floor in another day or two. I understand what the gentleman's saying, and he's quite correct. And, and I understand what my friend from New York is saying. And yes, you're certainly correct that we should be debating more openly than we have been our policy in Haiti, especially which the gentleman uh, has been at the forefront of, of discussing. But my, my contention simply was to our friend from upstate New York that even with worries about Cuba, even with worries about Haiti, even with worries about North Korea, the defense budget authorization of close to $264 billion, one would think, since it's you know, only 80-85% of what we, it's 80-85% of what we were expending, authorizing just a few years ago with the Warsaw Pact and the Soviet Union very much in, in focus and, and a real worry of ours, ought to be enough money. Obviously, we have to shift some resources, and obviously some things are being spent through the military budget that you and perhaps I would like to see come from other budgets. But uh, I would like to think that spending $240 billion or close to it could take care of these little guys and even a few other little guys who might pop up as trouble spots over the next year or so. Would, would I, I, yield at some point? I, I would be very happy to yield to you if I may make a quick point back to the gentleman from California first, and, and that is I, I think that that much of that money, that $260 billion, which is a tremendous amount of money, to be sure, goes to salaries and, and, um, and, and you know, paying men and women in uniform. And that, that basically is jobs, and, and there's that factor to it. And you can't just take those away and say, we aren't going to do that, because then you've created another problem, and those folks need income, and they need a profession, they need to do things, they need to be at least retrained, and then get back into some kind of civilian job. So that's not as easy as it sounds. And that is a big chunk of that money. But the other part of it is, is staying on a technological edge. And that is where I think the debate and the judgment call largely does come in. I mean, I don't know how many of this type of uh, Star Wars type things are great or is a good investment or not. A lot of people don't. We don't know what works quite often. But uh, I think that that balance is a, is a good uh, subject to the debate. And I have no problem uh, having the debate as long as we realize that I think we've got to keep pushing the envelope all the time. We can't be standing still or going backwards just because this week the guys who are running what used to be the major enterprise that was uh, of concern to us in our national security happens to be uh, smiling at us or grinning or at least not frowning at us because we don't know exactly what's going to be there next week. It may not be the same. It may be a, a, a disparate type of threats to us a variety of different places, terrorism, uh, a different approach to things. I don't know. Those nobody seems to know. But I think we need to keep a cap capability up, and I think that does sometimes require some investment in faith to look ahead. I happen to yield the gentleman from New York. Well, yeah. 
I don't want to get exercised again with my good friend uh, Tony Balenson, but uh, he says he, he thinks and he hopes that there's enough money there to take care of these chaps. Now, <laughs> you know, I'm looking at an article that appeared in the, in the, in the uh, New York Times, which is certainly not a conservative newspaper by any stretch of the imagination. And I would ask unanimous consent to be able to submit this uh, article for the record. Without objection. Uh, which appeared back on June 12th of 1994. The article is entitled, As Military Pay Slips Behind, Poverty Invades the Ranks. I'm going to read you just a couple of paragraphs of this, okay? Because it rankles me when I hear statements like, I hope there is enough money to take care of these chaps. Like other airmen at Hickman Air Force, Hickam Air Force Base in Honolulu, 21-year-old Jason Edwards worries about tensions far away in North Korea that could erupt in fighting and involve his base. But Airman Edwards has more immediate concerns as well. He is worried about how to feed his 22-year-old wife, Beth, and their two small children on his total pay and allowances of $1,330 a month. Add that by 12, my friends. In desperation, the Edwards last month began drawing $228 a month in food stamps to get by. I won't go on and read this whole very, very lengthy article in the New York Times, but it says, in a trend that has senior Pentagon officials deeply troubled, an increasing number of military families are turning to food stamps to just to try to make ends meet, and the, the article goes on and on and on and on. And this is what I was talking about. You know, if we're going to maintain a, a, a vol voluntary military, we have to try to keep pace. And Tony, it hasn't gone down just 15%. Since 1985, in real adjusted dollars for inflation, it's gone down 35%. We don't have a decent military budget today. And anybody who has worked with that budget over the years can tell you so, whether you're a member of this Congress or whether you've been over in the Pentagon all that time. I thank the gentleman for his time. Mr. Frost of Texas. I have no question. No question. Mr. Chairman, do, could I make just one statement? You can make two statements, sir. You know, I've listened to this debate with, with some interest. I made the statement 10 years ago that if the Soviet Union fell off the end of the world, that the uh, defense contractors, together with uh, members of uh, the House and the Senate, would find a reason to increase uh, defense spending. And I, I just want to state for the record that I was right. Okay. Uh, question comes on the motion of the gentleman from California. Oh, okay. All right. We uh, lack a quorum at the time, so we'll put that off for till now. Now we'll go into the uh, the health bill. The uh, where is the sheet? Ray, you got the sheet? Well, we have one outstanding witness here anyway. I guess that's it. Sam Johnson. Yeah, I know. Well, we'll recognize the Honorable Sam Johnson of Texas. Thank you, sir. I need some health care. There's a ring I got morning uh, had two articles that talked about us doing omnibus bills that we're too grandiose up here and need to focus on the things that really need to be fixed and that's what our prescription for health act does it gives the American people what they want right now it doesn't attempt to do everything at once it's imperative that we approach health care reform carefully and methodically, and this bill, to my feelings, is a sensible start down the road to reform. Passing this bill won't preclude us from doing more next year, and members can go back to their districts and show constituents that Congress is operating in good faith. The American people will know that Congress is beginning to tune up what is already the finest health care system in America. The public's well aware of the huge multiple page bills circulating on the Hill and they know that members and their staffs are not going to have time to study these bills. Members will have time to read the Prescription for Health Act, know exactly what they're voting for and be able to explain it to their constituents. This Prescription for Health Act guarantees portability 
tax fairness, medical savings accounts, and medical malpractice reforms. These reforms are widely supported by members of the Congress and the American public as a whole. These are not controversial reforms, and they're sensible, and to my way of thinking, and a lot of my friends, the best start to helping people get health insurance and bring health care costs down. A major concern people have is that they will lose their insurance if they lose or change jobs. This bill protects people who have been insured for at least 12 consecutive months from being denied coverage or out of coverage. It ensures portability. For those individuals who are not eligible for employer-based insurance programs, a tax fairness provision allows them to deduct 100% of their health insurance premiums. That means we put out a level playing field where big and small employers alike get the same tax deductions across the board. Medical savings accounts, as most of you know, will help reduce the cost of providing insurance and help people plan for future health needs. Employers and individuals will have the option to make tax deductible contributions to medical savings accounts, and people know what they're spending on medical care, and I'm sure you know what medical savings accounts are all about. We've talked about them forever. Medical malpractice reform will directly affect the cost of health care. The cost of medical malpractice premiums just this year will be about $11 billion. This money is passed on to consumers through an increase in the fees for doctor visits and services. The malpractice reforms in this bill limit non-economic damages to $250,000, prohibit reimbursement from multiple sources for the same injury, and require the loser to pay for all attorney's fees and court costs. That should reduce some of that cost. I would be remiss if I didn't address the actual cost of the bill with you. Most of the bills now circulating will cost the country billions of dollars. In some case, I think the Senate bill is, uh, is estimated a trillion. My bill has no increased spending. The cost associated is a loss of revenue from the government, and these taxes are lost from allowing individuals to deduct the cost of their health care premiums from taxable income. I think that's fully supportable. It, again, establishes a level playing field. I've sent the bill to the Joint Economic Committee on Taxation for cost estimate. I don't know if you've got it yet or not. Calculations made by the Republican Study Committee show that the government may lose about $15 billion per year in tax revenue. And we ought to be willing to absorb that revenue loss by cutting spending somewhere else in order to ensure tax fairness to everyone. And I'm sure you would all agree. Uh, in fact, uh, probably that is going to be the lowest cost plan going. Congress has the opportunity to pass health care reform legislation before the August recess by passing this prescription for health and making the initial steps toward reform. And with that, I'll, I'm open to your questions. Bill. Yes, sir. Bill. Well, that's how it's filed. Yes, sir. And, uh, you don't feel there'd be any controversy and malpractice uh, uh, the way you fix the malpractice suits? Well, I have run it through uh, four different specialties in the Dallas area, uh, orthopedes, uh, cancer doctors, uh, 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 foot guys and, uh, and general practitioners, and they all like it. Uh, they have per, uh, pulsed their various associations, and they like it. Uh, it appears to me that the hospitals are in favor of this type of proposal as well. So uh, I haven't found any negative uh, thus far pulse in the medical profession. And, and you wouldn't. Uh, uh, the lawyers are probably the ones that are going to uh, object to some of those provisions, and uh, y'all can better sense that than I. Well, I, I think uh, the gentleman knows very well that uh, the insurance companies and the hospitals aren't the only players. Uh, I didn't realize there were so many players until I started getting lobbied on this bill. Isn't that the truth? You could start with the chiropodists and go up to the veterinarians and back again. <laughs> but uh, I was going to say, if this was the only bill, uh, if, if you say that this bill had no criticism, I would say that Congratulations, because uh, every bill that we start to address, uh, there's always, well, we've got to change this a little bit, we've got to bring in this. And I, I just think it's, it's uh, everybody knows it's a monumental task, uh, and we're going to do our best, but uh, 
you have this filed and you've got a cost uh, estimate on it? Say? Well, our uh, Republican uh, committee, study committee, oh, okay. uh, estimated the cost around $15 billion, uh, lost revenue. There is no tax implication. And uh, uh, we ran it through the tax uh, committee for uh, reference, and I don't know if they've gotten the uh, cost analysis done yet or not. Are you aware? They haven't. Okay. It's uh, Derek. Let me add, if I may, yes, sir, surely. that the uh, uh, Taxpayers Union has uh, uh, approved this bill and gotten behind it, and uh, uh, our uh, study committee has gotten behind it and run the traps on it. Heritage has as well. Okay. Mr. Derrick? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll just be very brief. And I and I'm regret that I'm not more familiar with your bill. I will try to become more familiar with it as the time goes on. But does this provide universal coverage? Well, uh, no. It, it addresses the, uh, the fact that people who uh, can't get insurance when they change jobs uh, and are uh, quit a job and move somewhere else, they do have portability. So in that sense, we are guaranteeing more insurance across the board. Uh, Pre-existing conditions are waived? They are if, the, uh, if they've had insurance for 6 or 12 months, depending on the condition. Do you have an employer mandate in this bill? No, sir. There are no mandates at all. Well, no taxes. You know, it seems to me from the figures, and as I said, and I've, I, I state again that I've not read your bill, uh, but, you know, all of the figures that I've seen, if you do not have universal coverage and you do not have some sort of mandate in there, what you're doing is piling additional cost on the middle income person in this country. Because, you know, I agree with you that we, we should el eliminate the refusal for coverage for pre-existing uh, 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 illnesses or injuries and, and also in changing jobs. That's a wonderful thing. But of course what happens then is the people who are getting to the age that they're concerned about health care problems or they have health care problems or they have pre-existing uh, injuries sign up and, uh, and 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 those who are healthy in many instances uh, like my 22 year old son I would imagine don't sign up and uh, it, it, people who, who have insurance now in the 20 to seventy thousand dollar particularly in the thirty to forty thousand dollar family income range, we'll see their premium shoot up. And, and we'll still have 20 or 30 million people that are not insured. Well, that's precisely why we uh, ask for six to 12 months of insurance before we allow any pre-existing pre conditions. If you know you got something wrong with you, you can get insurance today. Uh, you might have to pay more for it, but you can get it. Well, I mean, you and can't get it if you can't pay for it. I mean, you know, I mean, that's the whole idea of the whole system. We've got great health care in this country if you're rich and you can afford it or either you're poor enough to get under some federal program. It's the, it's the people that can't afford it, well, the middle-income people in this country that are being taken to the cleaners. I think that's a, not middle-income. I would object to that. I think that's an argument we need to have on the Well, I, it is. I mean, all the statistics are, uh, that uh, are run. I mean, I well, have, I I have seen the Republican... I, I have seen the, I have seen the Republican conference statistics, but, uh, you know, uh, those which uh, we would uh, assume would be uh, objective uh, about it uh, show that, that, in fact, you know, the problem is not... <laughs> the, I mean, you've hit upon the problem. Can't afford, if you can afford it. Sure, no. if you can afford it. If you can afford it, there's no problem. Yes, there is. No, there's it problem. because it's out there to get if you can afford it. No, if, if you reduce uh, the cost of litigation, I feel that uh, health care costs are going to come down. The doctors can feel more at home, and so will the insurance companies. As a matter of fact, the two larger companies, Aetna and... Uh, can't call the other name at the moment in Dallas are talking about reducing costs now uh, without us doing anything and I, I think mandates are just uh, something we ought to talk about at length and, and really next year when we can solve some of the problem right now. Sam did I understand you correctly when you said that you can get insurance uh, uh, for pre-existing conditions? Uh, is that a blanket statement uh, or just some pre-existing conditions? Uh, it's, uh, there aren't any four standard benefits in there and uh, it guarantees portability after you've had coverage for 
uh, 12 continuous months. In, in I understand other words. that. And, and, uh, no, but in, in the, uh, the conversation between you and Derek, uh, you, you said that... Uh, Insurance and health plans cannot exclude pre-existing conditions for individuals after they've had insurance for 12 months. Now, if and what that does is preclude what just what he was talking about, which is the case in most of these bills where somebody gets sick and they go buy insurance, but they don't buy it until they get sick. So what we're saying is get your insurance and then you can, you can be covered. If you get cancer or whatever, you can be covered. No, they can't you, refuse But it. you said that right now you can go out and buy insurance even with pre-existing conditions. Well, I know uh, uh, friends of mine that do. Really? But what are those pre-existing conditions? Have to search for it. Have to search for it. Well, Mr. Mr. Derrick. Of course you have to search for it. You have to search deep down in your pocket for it is what you have to do. Sure, you can get, uh, 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 you can get, uh, you can get, you can, you can buy just about anything in this world, including health care insurance, if you have enough money. The whole point is that we have millions and millions and millions of Americans in the middle income group who can no longer afford it. Well, I still disagree with you. Well, I, I understand think, that. I think government mandates are I, certainly not the way to go in a I appreciate you. system. You know, I America. appreciate your thoughtful input. I think in, you agree in, with me. Input into it. Thank you very much. Mr. Thank Solomon. you, sir. <coughs> Sam, ever since you came to this Congress, uh, you've been a breath of fresh air, and I, for one, really appreciate you. You know, uh, one thing I like about your bill is I think it has uh, 61 pages. <laughs> and most of, most of them have several thousand pages, it seems like. That's right. Uh, but, you know, meaningful tort reform that would really limit attorney fees and limit these exorbitant, uh, I see it there, uh, limit these exorbitant court awards for pain and suffering that the rest of us end up having to pay through increased insurance premiums. You know, that is something that has so, uh, been needed so long in this Congress. and. For some reason, we've never been able to even move anywhere in that direction, just like we haven't with product liability and a lot of other things that the trial lawyers seem to, to just have their fist on and we can't move anything in this Congress because of it. But if we had meaningful tort reform like your bill, it would certainly drive down the cost of health insurance. You know, I, uh, I get a little uh, uneasy citing the New York Times editorials. I just cited one just before you came in and, you know, when I first came to this Congress, I used to read the New York Times editorials so that I would uh, then take the opposite position and, uh, and always be right representing my constituents in upstate New York. But uh, here's another one uh, by, there was uh, just Sunday, August 14th, and I'll ask an animal consent to well, submit it for the record. <laughs> and You're it's not in, selling the New York Times, are you? <laughs> I, feel like, page I, feel like, by page. I feel like I am. Hey, but you um, yield for just a moment? I'd be glad to yield to my friend. <laughs> uh, Sam and I both represent Dallas, and we used to be able to do the same thing with the Dallas Morning News, but they're not nearly as dependable anymore <laughs> in terms of their editorial policy. And uh, it used to be that they were always on Sam's side and not on my side, but now they get the they get a little confused from time to time. I uh -huh. found. Well, I would agree with that. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sure the New York Times is confused too, then, uh, because uh, this this article. Uh, I'd be to my other retiring friend. I'd be glad to yield. I won't have much opportunity. Uh, who, who is it that said that the New York Times was uh, was not a conservative? Did I hear someone say that? I, that someone did. Someone just mm -hmm. testified about just a few. Well, it was probably me. What? But, uh, 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 well, I suppose you don't think the Wall Street Journal is conservative either. The Wall Street, well, I think they're, uh, they're pretty conservative, uh, except for a guy by the name of uh, Al Hunt that writes for them and uh, a couple of others. But uh, uh, certainly their uh, finest let, contributor, let, let me, my uh, friend Al Hunt. <laughs> 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 let me reclaim my time for a minute and then try to get this, uh, this editorial into the record. But it's, uh, it states, take it or leave it, health woes, votes. And, uh, you know, they are concerned about uh, the same thing I think that all of us are. Let me just read the last paragraph first because it says, before the House can begin to create an acceptable bill, members need the freedom to amend the bills that their leaders will put before them. If the leaders insist on imposing King of the Hill procedures, the outcome will be anything but lordly. And they go on to explain this King of the Hill. And uh, they really go on to explain why members like you that have substantive amendments and, and substitutes ought to be able to offer your amendment on the floor. And it says, 
Under the King of the Hill procedure, health bills will be voted upon in present order, uh, in preset order, with Mr. Gephardt's leadership bill apt to go last. Several bills might pass, or all of them might fail, but all of those approved, whichever passes last, will be declared the victor. Even if a bill passed earlier that had more yes votes, we're still, no bill could be amended unless the sponsor endorsed the amendment. And you know, that is no way to, uh, to legislate, and we're gonna get ourselves right back in the same position we were in when this House passed catastrophic uh, illness uh, insurance uh, many a number of years ago. Uh, I'd like to read the rest of this, but we've got more people to testify here, Sam, but your amendment is certainly worthy and uh, should be considered by this body, and I hope you have the opportunity to debate it on the floor. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you coming. Well, uh, as the gentleman uh, knows, we, we're uh, going to consider a lot of bills, and we're not going to shut out anything that is cost-effective in, in states' uh, uh, different points of views. Oh, is, uh, that, is that right? That's, well, I mean, that's these very are good. substitutes. Wait a minute. These are substitutes. Now, I... Uh -huh. I mean, if some substitutes are close, of course, you're not going to have everyone on there. But we'll, you know we always put the majority and the minorities substitutes in there. Well, that's, uh, that's two. But uh, I have here a list of, uh, of about nine that have been filed, and all right. of them, whether you agree with them or not, I, I, am, I'm, I'm uh, so, sure. I am so opposed to single payer. But that's a reasonable substitute, and that ought to be given its day in court. I agree with you. Mr. Rowland just walked in, the bipartisan member, the Democrat member of the, of the bipartisan committee. His certainly ought to be made in order, and, uh, and so should Mr. Johnson's. What well, Mr. Thomas got his arm around him for because he's so bipartisan. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope that's what it is. <laughs> well, uh, Mr. Billinson. Thanks. Just a couple of comments, Mr. Chairman. I, I find it interesting that our more conservative colleagues who are so much against government mandates of one kind are for mandating what kind of coverage the insurance company should be required to give. Until now, only the states uh, had jurisdiction over over the insurance companies and their policies. Now, apparently, even, even our Republican friends want the federal government to take over jurisdiction and to mandate certain requirements as to what insurance companies would be required to put in their coverage. I'd rather like it myself, but I, I just wanted to point that out. And secondly, with respect to tort reform, which I think any sensible person, other than some of our friends in the Trial Lawyers Association, uh, ought to be four. I mean, mo most of us believe this is too litigious a society. We have twice as many lawyers or more than twice as many lawyers as we ought to have. This is a problem that extends far beyond the problem of medical malpractice or, or health care, such as we're talking about here. And I do hope whatever bill we, we, we come up with has some, has some useful and, and relatively strong malpractice insurance, however you, want to, however you want to describe it. At the same time, members should not be, should, you know, should not believe that, that we're going to solve much of the problem, unfortunately, of, of costs in, in health care by, by doing this. The AMA itself, about a year ago, uh, put out an estimate where they added up everything conceivable that they could think of, including the, pra the, the cost of, of practicing defensive medicine, running uh, extra tests. Many of them, the doctors thought themselves to be un unnecessary or un not worthwhile. Uh, they talked about medical malpractice premiums, which have, which have uh, leveled off in a number of states because of of uh, steps that many of the states, including our own California, have taken. But they added everything up and they came to a little bit less than $40 billion. Now, that's a lot of money, but it's only in toto, and no matter what kind of reforms, even if the, the medical profession itself, and I very much support most of its suggestions, were totally successful, you're not going to get rid of more than half of that $40 billion. But the $40 billion is 4% of the t costs of medical care in this country. So even if you got rid of 50%, you're talking about cutting cost 2%. It's worthwhile doing. It's worth doing for all kinds of reasons, Sam, as you understand. Uh, but nonetheless, I don't think we should hold it out as, as, as the big cost saver in any of these packages. I hope we do do it, uh, but it's, uh, we have to do a lot of other things, too, including, I think, as Mr. Derrick, our friend here, was suggesting, spreading the risk. One problem with making insurance better, as the gentleman wants to do, and as all of us, I think, want to do, and I think every plan now the Democratic alternatives and the single payers and the more conservative ones and the bipartisan ones, have, most of them have much of what our friend from Texas is, is proposing, is proposing in, in their bills. But the problem remains uh, that which we have right now, and that is 20 to 30 percent of all the money that each of us pays for his, whether we're an employer or a family member who buys insurance for our families, the 20 to 30 percent of the premium cost that we pay is for covering people who are not covered, who are not involved in the system. Uh, small businesses, the two-thirds of them that, that pay to cover their employees, 
uh, are paying to cover the employees of small businesses that cannot or refuse to or don't want to or are not interested in or are unable to pay for covering their employees. And that's, that's the, the reason for trying to seek to, to spread this out to as universal coverage as possible. We can make insurance better and better, and I totally agree with what you've got here, and we all do, but some of us don't want to extract it and just put it in a single bill, but want to have it as part of some larger bill, whatever other direction uh, we go. But we've got to try to ensure that that risk is spread more widely and that those who are not now involved in, 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 in buying their own insurance get, get to do so one way or another. Just one quick comment. It's exactly the same in many respects as automobile insurance. I think three times in my life I've been hit by other drivers. In all three on all three occasions, they didn't have insurance. They're required to in the state of California, but they don't have it. So we all have to pay a little more, a little higher on our driver's license, on our, on our insurance, automobile insurance for the uninsured drivers. That's what we're doing now, all of us, to the tune of 20 or 30 percent for uninsured health people. So we've got to both do what Mr. Johnson is suggesting as well as, as bring everybody, as many people at least as possible, under that tent. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Thanks, Chairman. Sam. Uh, I'd just like to say that there aren't any four standards benefits in this bill. I mean, we're not requiring the insurance companies to, to uh, uh, insure specific things, and that, that therefore, is no mandate. Uh, I do agree with you. I think you made the best argument for not doing a government health plan when you talked about automobile insurance because that's exactly what's happening in Texas. The people aren't insured, and yet they're mandated to have insurance. So, uh, you know, how is a mandate on health care going to make everybody get it? I don't think it will. Sam, uh, let me just ask you one uh, series line of questions, if I may. Um, we have here in the, in the committee room the authors of the Roland Bilirakis uh, bill, and we'll be hearing from them a little bit later. How does your bill differ from Roland Bilirakis as you understand Roland Bilirakis? And I qualify it in that way. Well, I had a comparison, and I, uh, I'm not sure what their, uh, what their bill does now, because they've rewritten it, I believe. Yeah. Well, I think that it, it had to be filed with us as of a time certain, so I think it's frozen in time, but you may not have Well, they recent. had employer mandates. I don't have any. They had standard benefit practices. Uh, now, excuse packages. me, if I, if I may interrupt you. They, I don't believe they have employer mandates in their bill, they Sam. Did. I believe in their current bill they do not. Currently doesn't. Previous one never had. Well, it was the same as. It, it required health uh, plans to offer standard plans. You put a minimum on there. All but not pay for it. That's right. But a minimum is the same as an action. Talk about Bill Arrakis, Roland. It, that's, that's right. Yeah, no, we're talking about Roland Bill Arrakis, yeah. Excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, Sam, the, the, the we're reason, not, we're the, not the, 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 quest, the question I ask you is, is not an idle question because we will, we can't make in order every single bill that people bring before us. And the question is, uh, how much different is your bill from there are no bill mandates and no standard package provisions. Uh, basically, uh, that's the difference between mine and most of the other Republican or uh, uh, bills. And. Uh, we have a medical savings. I don't know if they have one now or not. They did. I believe before. they do. Uh, yes, sir. And uh, we eliminate state mandated benefits, and I think they do for small employers. Uh, I require the. Uh, this bill requires the uh, doctors and hospitals to give you a. Uh, uh, cost analysis before you get something done except an emergency and uh, they're, thereby allowing you to uh, go uh, check around and see what the lowest cost is for yourself if you buy your own insurance and uh, uh, I don't believe their plan does that. Great idea. Sir? Great idea. <clears throat> the antitrust is about the same I believe and the malpractice uh, differs in, uh, in amounts and years of uh, uh, timing involved, and that's about it. Okay, well, let me ask you, have you, uh, at, at any point, have you attempted to talk to the authors of the Roland Bilirakis bill and see if, uh, if, if you could become a part of that group, if it were your legislation were close enough that uh, if their legislation would achieve your object objectives? Well, you're probably as aware as I am that there were five people on either side putting that thing together mm -hmm. in the end, and uh, uh, I have talked to a couple other people, but I haven't from that regard. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I've, uh, I've been interested in their legislation. I went to one of the meetings where their legislation was discussed, and uh, uh, I, I just, uh, we do have a problem. This committee has a problem in being able to, uh, uh, to determine the, the number of votes, the number of measures that will be up before the House, and making sure that the legislation that we do put up, that the substitutes are significantly different, or, or at least uh, have major differences in them, so that we're not voting on virtually the same bill uh, on several occasions. And I think you can appreciate the, the problem that the committee faces in that regard. I have no other questions. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Goss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, uh, Sam, the, the point that I think uh, Mr. Frost getting at is is um, going to probably manifest itself a little bit after the next panel of witnesses gets through after your presentation as well. There are some differences. Uh, you don't have uh, anything like actuarial equivalency or modified community rating or any of those uh, programs in your, because you leave it pretty much to a free insurance market. But as I understand free your, enterprise, yes, sir. Yeah. And what I understand you do is you, you uh, basically tell the insurance companies that they got to provide insurance to anybody who wants it and they set the price and the free enterprise system works it out. And that's basically the way you're going on this thing. Is that right? Market driven, yes. Right. It's market driven. Okay. And I think that's clear because I think you'll find that as the testimony will show that there's quite a difference uh, between a pure market driven program um, which has got the cost savings that you've uh, indicated in the malpractice and some of the other defensive medicine diagnostic uh, issues that have been out there. You've included those for cost savings and your answer on the coverage is that anybody can get insurance if they'll just go get it and uh, the I think you'll see the bipartisan bill approaches it a little differently and make sure that not only do people have the opportunity to get insurance uh, but they also have the opportunity to get medical attention um, in a different way and there are provisions for that. But those things will be clear. And I congratulate you for bringing this forward. I think we need one of these horses in the race. Uh, this is about the purest, just plain business uh, response uh, of any, I think, that are out there. And I think it's worth uh, having it there uh, for comparison reasons. And I'm sure we'll get some su support as well. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate this committee, Mr. Uh, Derrick. Well, it wasn't that important. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We would be uh, delighted to, to hear from uh, the Honorable Karen Thurman and the Honorable Dick Durbin. I believe you both want to testify together. Is that correct? I'm Court Thurman, and I have three other members now. And I actually have two, one of which Mr. Durbin and I have been working on. Um, and then one that, that probably has some effect on his, but I haven't let him really see it, so I don't know if he wants to support it at this point in well, any way. Well, we'll have to leave that up to him. Uh, <laughs> we uh, would be delighted to have you uh, put your statement on the record and summarize mm -hmm. if you care to do so, both of you. Mr. Thurman, you uh, may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and members. This is actually an issue that started as um, far back as uh, 1990 and then carried on until uh, August of 1993 where there was a GAO report that came out on Medicaid. Um, actually it was requested by Senator Bumpers and Senator Mack in dealing with the issue of Medicaid reimbursement to the states. Um, very disturbing to states like, my, like Florida and California and New York and Texas and places of those natures that we've really gotten kind of shortchanged in all of this to the point where there are some states that are getting as little as 54 percent return and others are getting as much as 83 percent return. So what we've tried to do is to come up based on the GAO report um, alternatives for improving the distribution of funds to states. Um, what the objective was basically um, is actually repeated in the front of the study, and if it's at all possible, I'd like to have these both put in the record, both the hearing by the Committee on the Government of Operations in December 7th. Want the whole hearing put in the record? Yeah, I, or just whatever this okay. we'll book put is, the, and, we'll and put then the, little the GAO one in. Okay. report. Um, and basically what they're suggesting is that there were 
uh, three changes that should be made to the existing formula for distributing Medicaid funds to states. First, with squaring the per capita income factor should be discontinued and replaced with income measured on a per person and poverty basis. Second, that the current minimum guaranteed federal reimbursement rate of 50% should be reduced. And these changes would improve tax burden equity among states and reduce reimbursement to lower need states. And third was to use total, total taxable resources should be substituted for per capita income. I might add to this is that we already, in fact, have changed at least one of our formulas to a TTR, uh, which had to do with the alcohol um, mental health service block grants, because we had they had actually substitute per capita income for distributing those federal funds. So there is some precedence uh, already that this Congress has acted on to, in fact, uh, suggest that maybe we are a little bit hard behind the times and that the GAO report suggests that we are. And I might add to you that uh, at least in, in the time that we've put, um, this is actually filed as a bill, um, we had all of our members from Florida sign on to it and we've continually picked up support from several other members from those particular states that have some, some same similar problems, uh, which is probably more than half of Congress. So with that, we just would like to have the opportunity to have the amendments uh, offered and suggested that they would be offered to all of the uh, bills that might be suggested or, or given the opportunity to be heard on the floor. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm uh, here in support of uh, Mrs. Thurman's amendment. I don't know how we contrived this formula in 1965. We attempted to determine how many poor people were in each state. Then we attempted to determine the ability of each state to pay for this medical care. The formulation that we came up with has never been repeated to my knowledge. It was somewhat unique. Skeptics might suggest that it was designed to come up with a majority of votes on the floor to pass the bill. Uh, that's entirely possible. Those. <laughs> <laughs> Those sorts of things do occur, uh, but I think it's time for us. Well, we certainly do hope we can pass that crime bill. But the uh, Medicaid reimbursement formula, I know, is uh, causing genuine problems. Some of the states that are supposedly uh, not poor and have ability to pay, in fact, face real serious difficulties. New York, California, Illinois being examples of those. I support uh, Mrs. Thurman's uh, amendment. I have several of my own, and I think she has another one as well. Do you have another one? Yeah. This one actually deals with the issue of Medicare reimbursement, and specifically, as we've, we're starting to debate the health care issue, the hospitals within Florida have come to me on a, a very serious issue as they see it, and I'll just give you a, an, op, an understanding of, of the district. Uh, in some parts of the district, and there being nine counties, uh, some parts of my district are probably getting anywhere between 75 to 80 percent reimbursement back from Medicare. That is, that is their income. Um, in other parts of it, it's as high as 80 percent. The national average from what we've been able to gather is about 45 percent, putting Florida at a very disproportionate share of dollars when you look at what their return is from Medicare dollars within those hospitals and maintaining uh, their hospitals. So what we've tried to do is instead of, of saying, okay, we just need to change the formula, we've tried to put a study together, uh, which is basically what the amendment does, so that there would be uh, some information given back to us and then even actually asking for it to maybe be looked at legislatively to be reinterpreted or to change the Medicare disproportionate formula back to the hospitals as, as um, they come back with the information. So that's basically all we've tried to do in these two amendments. I'm not a, I can speak to my amendments or if you'd like to question Ms. Thurman on hers. Why don't we speak to yours? All right, if, if I might, I, I have three, and uh, they range from the... Are these substitutes or amendments? These are amendments. First, let me uh, note that 70 million Americans uh, this year received a federal income tax refund. And uh, with that federal income tax refund, they received an unsolicited card urging them to buy World Cup 1994 commemorative coins. The insertion of these cards in federal income tax refunds uh, with federal income tax refund checks 
cost the taxpayers of this country $210,000. I assume that the Treasury can justify the insertion of this card, but I'd like to suggest there might be a better use. What I'm calling for as part of this health care reform bill is at least on a one-year experimental basis that we include with federal income tax refund checks to the 70 million, approximately 70 million Americans who receive them, uh, a card which would give them an opportunity to sign up as organ donors. Uh, we have uh, discussed this with the Treasury. They think it's a good use of this card, but they say they need specific legislation for the authority to do so. We've turned to the medical groups that are interested in uh, organ transplants and find that virtually every one of these groups encourages it. We're talking about a target population and age uh, that is optimal for this discussion. We're talking about encouraging folks as they receive these cards to discuss it with their family members. It turns out that some 2,500 Americans each year die on waiting lists while they're waiting for an organ transplant. There are no donors. More than 31,000 people are now waiting for a transplant in America, including 1,500 children and more than 23,000 people who must have kidney dialysis. This is a very minor item in comparison to the major ideas which will be discussed. I hope we can consider it. It's one of the amendments which I'd like to offer to give the Treasury the authority to try this one year in 1996 on an experimental basis. If I can switch to the two other amendments very quickly. I listened very closely as uh, Congressman Sam Johnson testified about his theories on a market economy, and Mr. Goss agreed with him. One of the important elements in a market-driven economy is an informed consumer. One of the amendments which I'm offering, uh, hope to offer on the floor, would create a consumer guide to prescription drugs in America. Right now, most of us are aware of the fact that the prescription drug inflation in our country is more than 15 times greater than the increase in prices for all other uh, products. We're also aware of the gross disparity in the cost of prescription drugs between Europe and the United States for the very same drug, and also in many other parts of the world. What I hope to do with this uh, consumer guide to prescription drugs is to give consumers as well as health care providers basic information each year on changes in prescription drug prices so that uh, doctors in particular and consumers as well can look to alternatives and also be mindful of what appear to be unreasonable increases so that we can ask uh, the pharmaceutical companies for an explanation. That is uh, one of the other amendments which I'll offer. The final one, I'm sure, is the most controversial and won't surprise you that I offer it. The President suggested uh, an increase in the tobacco tax to 75 cents uh, from the current 24 cent federal level. As a result of the Ways and Means Committee uh, decision and the decision in the Senate by uh, Senator Mitchell, as well as by Majority Leader Gephardt, that has been reduced to 45 cents. Uh, what I am suggesting is that we return to the President's standard of 75 cent package. The additional 30 cents in revenue which we would get from uh, the tobacco tax that is imposed would be used for four specific purposes. First, to provide additional subsidies for small business so that they can insure their employers. That's a concern all of us have wherever we stand on the issue of employer mandates. This additional revenue from the higher federal tobacco tax would provide more subsidies to small business to cover their employees. Second, to expand long-term care programs, particularly home health care. I was, I guess, uh, a little put out, this is the first time I've said anything publicly, that during the course of the debate, the Ways and Means Committee reduced the tobacco tax and ended up cutting the benefits by, by stretching out the period of time before home health care went into effect. With this increase back to 75 cents, we can start helping senior citizens stay at home, take care of themselves, and stay out of nursing homes by providing this money. There's also money that can be raised here for increased biomedical research funding. The fact of the matter is that the National Institute of Health only funds one out of every four qualified applications. We need to have more medical research. I think it is very appropriate that the increased revenue from a federal increase in the tobacco tax uh, be used for that purpose. Another one which... Uh, the gentleman uh, suspended. Uh, we have a forum here on the rules committee, and I'd like to uh, bring up the conference report uh, on the National Defense Authorization Act. Microphone. Microphone. Uh, Microphone. <laughs> the uh, Chairman. gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Butler Derrick. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee grant a rule waiving all points of order against the conference report and against its consideration. You've heard the motion, gentlemen, South Carolina. 
Mr. Chairman? Mr. Goss? Do we have uh, in the record what those points of order might be? Yeah. Uh, the letter from Mr. Dellums. Uh, Thank you very much. I did come in late for the hearing, but I wanted to make sure, since we've made a concern on this point before, that we actually had a record, and we will know what is protected. I thank the Chairman for that assurance. Okay. Mr. Solomon? <laughs> Mr. Chairman, we had uh, extensive uh, debate uh, on the uh, conference report on National Defense Authorization Act earlier. And uh, this, uh, this rule that we're going to put out does waive all points of order against the conference report. However, uh, Chairman Dellums and uh, the ranking Republican, Mr. Spence, were good enough uh, to give us uh, uh, the specifics on all of those waivers. Uh, I think that uh, all of us have had ample time to, uh, to examine the report, uh, as extensive as it is. And although many of us will be voting against this report uh, on the floor, I see no reason to oppose the, uh, the rule. And we would be supporting it when we when we go to the floor. Any other statements? If not, on the motion, the gentleman from South Carolina. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The rules adopted. Mr. Frost of Texas will carry the rule for the majority. And Mr. Solomon will carry for the Republicans. Okay. Now we'll go back to. Uh, Thank you very much, Chairman. Chairman and I, I will wrap up here very briefly. Uh, one of the provisions in this bill is to take the money generated from this uh, additional federal tobacco tax and to basically deal with economic conversion for tobacco farmers. I, have, I am not the darling of the tobacco interest, as you well So I've heard. So you've heard. <laughs> but I can tell you that in private and confidential conversation, many people representing tobacco farmers tell me that if they had a buyout provision to get out of the federal program, they'd take advantage of it. And we could close down once and for all this tobacco allotment program, which is so controversial and I think so counterproductive in terms of our nation's health. This provision, which I am suggesting, would provide the revenue for it. Let me say just very briefly, it is not only an increase in the uh, t tax on cigarettes, which uh, we all know is a cause of uh, the greatest single preventable cause of death in this country, but it also raises the tax, as it should be raised, on the tobacco of choice for the smallest children in America. And I'm talking about chewing tobacco and spit tobacco. The average age for kids to start carrying those round cans in their back pockets and sticking that uh, little pinch down in the bottom of their gum is nine. Nine. That's the average age. And we have a tax at such an embarrassingly low level on this product, it does all but encourage the kids to use it. So what I'm suggesting is to bring that tax up to a level not only to discourage kids from their favorite tobacco products, the spit tobacco, but also from cigarettes as well. Thank you. Mr. Billison, any questions? No, good idea. Sir. Mr. Okay. Solomon. <clears throat> well, I, don't, uh, I don't have your amendments, uh, either of them here. Have you filed those uh, with the committee? We have. Both of you? Mine should have been Yes. We'll make sure you get a copy, though. Well, I'm sure the committee will, but okay. uh, I don't have any further questions. We appreciate you coming before us. Ms. Slaughter, Ms. Goss, Mr. Goss. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, oh. Okay. Uh, we'll hear the panel consisting of the Honorable Roy Rowland, uh, Jim Cooper, Dave McCurdy, Mike Parker, Charles Stenholm, uh, Bill Thomas, Michael Bilarakis, Fred Grandy, and Dennis Hastert. Gentlemen, who is present here? Mr. Chairman and member of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you here today. As I'm sure most of you know, there are ten members, five from each side of the aisle, that have been working for several weeks now to fashion a bipartisan health reform proposal. This proposal uh, is gleaned from two proposals that uh, began development earlier last year. Uh, Jim Cooper and Fred Grandy, in a bipartisan effort, fashioned some legislation along the lines of managed competition and managed care. 
Michael Bilirakis and myself looked at those pieces of legislation that were out there already and took from those the areas where there seemed to be general agreement and put them together. During the past several weeks, uh, there have been this group of 10 who have worked together to merge these two pieces of legislation. Both of these are bipartisan and, uh, as I've said, spent several weeks of doing this to the point that we now believe that we've accomplished that. And we respectfully ask that uh, our uh, legislation be made in order by the Rules Committee when health reform legislation is considered on the floor of the House. Uh, you've already um, named the individuals who have been involved in this endeavor. And what we have done is to draw from the good work of Democrats and Republicans, members on both sides of the aisle, legislation that has previously uh, been introduced. We've added some new concepts to this uh, as well. Uh, we believe the proposal could significantly improve our health care delivery system uh, in this country uh, without damaging that valuable part of the system which we now have. We are without a doubt, the preeminent nation in the world in providing quality health care. We are preeminent in medical and pharmaceutical research, and we do not want to see anything happen that might, in fact, endanger uh, that position that, uh, that, we, that we hold. Uh, when health system legislation is considered on the floor, uh, we, of course, as I said, strongly urge you to have a level playing field uh, for all of the legislation that uh, is considered. In a recent letter, 104 members of the House, 52 Democrats and 52 Republicans, uh, sent to Dick Gephardt, our majority leader, we said this alternative should be considered by the full House in the same manner as all other proposals are considered. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in addition, we acknowledge that the issue of how abortion is handled in health reform is a unique concern which we believe demands a separate vote regardless of any amendment which might ultimately prevail on the floor. So we would request that that, that amendment uh, be made in order uh, as well. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, we are very pleased that, uh, that you're giving consideration uh, to our proposal. I can go into some of the details of the legislation, uh, if you like, or give you an overview. But at this, uh, at this point, perhaps I should yield and let uh, other members of this bipartisan working uh, group speak as well. Mr. Tom, Mr. Grandy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me uh, reiterate uh, what Dr. Rowland just said and, and try and put this in the context of the way the health care debate has evolved. The reason this coalition was formed, the reason it is the next generation of bipartisanship, is because clearly the debate has changed and public attitudes have changed, and I would have to say even public tolerance has changed on what I think Americans will allow in terms of health care reform in this session. The 10 members that helped write this bill and the many Republicans and Democrats that participated in writing the bill, although we're not in the room when we actually spent many hours putting together the final language, all agree that it is timely to try and bring a bill to the floor of Congress and vote on it and hopefully pass it this year. That is not to say, however, that the choices before us, principally the Ways and Means Bill, the Education and Labor Bill in the House, which have now evolved into the so-called uh, Gephardt-Clinton Bill, and the Finance Committee Bill and the, uh, and the um, Labor Bill in the House in the Senate, which have become the Clinton-Mitchell Bill, are really representative of American preferences for health care choices. This bill, I think, is. It acknowledges that it does not do as much, but it doesn't ask as much. Not as many taxes, no mandates, no uh, large government bureaucracies. And what we ask is the same treatment that you would give uh, committee bills that have already come before you and asked to be made in order. Principally, the Gebhardt proposal, which is based on the Ways and Means Bill, and the Republican proposal, which is based on H.R. 3080, have both had the benefit of previous estimates from CBO. Again, our bill was cobbled together from the Roland Bill Rackus team, from the Cooper Grandy Initiative, and we are being scored by CBO as well. 
but we would throw ourselves on the mercy of this committee and ask for the same deference that you will give the Republican alternative and the Democratic alternative. And by that I mean we will need to receive input from CBO and then we'll need sufficient time to digest the input, make adjustments in our proposal, receive additional input from CBO and make additional changes. So we would like to have the same amount of time in preparation for the floor that you will give all the other contenders for the health care crown. We don't think this is too much to ask. I would like to reiterate that, that this work has been done principally by staff members who are not affiliated with major committees, it's mostly member staff, some committee staff, but we have kind of been working in the shadows of the health care debate and would request uh, at least time to iron out some of the inevitable points and glitches that will occur in a piece of legislation this vast. Um, let me only add one more point, and that is, that is to what Dr. Rowland said about abortion. The people that put together this particular bill are pro-life and pro-choice. As a matter of fact, I think we kind of run the spectrum of views in terms of that particular issue. But we all agree, no matter what the language should say regarding Americans' choices on, on abortion as relates to publicly subsidized health care, that there should be an up or down vote on this particular subject that would relate to all bills and thereby hopefully neutralize uh, or at least harmonize this debate in the eyes of all of the members. Otherwise, I think we run the risk of devolving a major health care debate into a replay of an abortion debate which uh, has not, at least in my view, been successfully decided uh, in the time I've been in Congress. So I would hope that we will be given the chance to set aside this issue for a separate vote so members can record their preference on this issue independent of the merits of their legislation. Um, I too will be available for questions on the particular points in this bill, but rather than get into them now, I will lead, need, uh, yield to my colleagues for any comments they would make about Charles. making our bill in order. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a couple of other observations. I was uh, an original co-sponsor of the Cooper Grandy bill, the so-called managed competition approach. I then became a co-sponsor of the Roland Bellaracus. I've also spent a good part of the last uh, four years as co-chair of the Rural Health Care Coalition with our colleague Pat Roberts of Kansas, in which we have attempted to look at the unique aspects of rural small town America regarding whatever we might end up doing uh, in as far as health system reform is concerned and find that of all three of those bills now that uh, I wouldn't go so far as say the better points, but the consensus points uh, of all of those efforts, I think you will find in the bipartisan approach. That was the spirit in which we all came to the table. We spent a good part of a month uh, working day after day, night after night, and attempting to find a consensus to do, I think, one thing, and that's to attempt to fix what's broken about the best health care system the world has ever known. Uh, you know, it's interesting, as so many want to remake the wheel here, but most of the American people believe, as I do, that we have the best doctors, we have the best nurses, we have the best hospitals, we have the best pharmaceuticals, we have the best technology of any other country in the world. But we have some problems, not the least of which is cost. And cost is what we're hoping to, to solve with this. And the proposal that we come to you today is we believe that we offer the best opportunity of fixing what's broken, of moving incrementally, incrementally uh, to solve the problem. And we encourage uh, this committee to, to make this amendment in order. And I, too, uh, ditto the question regarding abortion is saying whatever, whatever bills pass, I think that that is an issue that must be handled separately and applied to all of the positions as the will of the majority of Congress should choose. Mr. Thomas. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I come uh, to this table with a slightly different background. I was not a co-sponsor of the Cooper Grandy bill, and I was not a co-sponsor of the Roland Bellaracus bill. Uh, my personal wishes were probably best made known in a, a, a bill that was filed both on the Senate side and on the House side, known as the Chafee Thomas bill. But my primary function over the last several months, it seems like years now, was to take the lead from my party in the Ways and Means Subcommittee on Health as the ranking member, investigate H.R. 3600, the President's bill, and look at options. We moved then to the full Committee on Ways and Means and examined health care options at the full committee level. 
throughout that process, the Ways and Means Committee uh, was the first, and I believe in terms of the number of hours of testimony, the committee that has gone uh, in depth uh, the most of any of the committees, and I have the dubious distinction of having sat in the chair virtually every hour of those subcommittee and full committee hearings. I came uh, to this group with that background and the desire to place in front of the House an option that seemed to be as realistic as possible. One of the concerns that we're going to have uh, as we begin examining the health care uh, options that this uh, committee will make an order on the floor is to one, make sure that there are sufficient options that all groups can find a home in terms of those positions that they wish to espouse. I don't know that it necessarily has to be the maximum number that have been offered, but I do think there should be sufficient options to cover the waterfront for someone to feel that they have something they can vote for rather than being in a position of having to vote against something. This issue is too important to members as well as the American public not to afford members that option. In addition, I discovered in the subcommittee and the full committee hearings that this is a subject matter in which Americans are just now becoming informed. Uh, one of the problems, in fact, uh, with the structure that we have is that perhaps most Americans are not as knowledgeable as they should be about their own health care coverage. This has been a very positive debate, and I do have to give the President credit for focusing uh, the health care debate in a way that we have had to grapple with problems that we haven't in the past. Uh, the press coverage. And the media coverage, I think, has in large part been educational as well. But I do think that the debate on the floor is going to have to be given a sufficient number of hours to develop the general theme and then sufficient hours for the substitutes to clearly draw the differences. We saw an example here briefly between the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Uh, Frost and, and Mr. Johnson, uh, simply exchanging uh, subheadings or title headings as the similarities or differences in the bills will not do justice to an understanding of what the options are that are in front of us. So I'm asking for a sufficient amount of time and in your wisdom I'm sure in the discussions that you will have you will come up uh, with a reasonable amount of time. I sincerely urge that you do not use the Senate and its current examination of the bills in front of the Senate as a reason for curbing in any way the discussion in the House. I frankly think that based upon what's gone on in subcommittee and committee, not just of the Ways and Means Committee, but of other committees, we have an opportunity to perhaps shed more light than heat on the options uh, that will be in front of us and that we will make for the American people. Uh, and, and finally, just let me say, uh, Mr. Chairman, that uh, what we have as a work product, uh, uh, underscoring the gentleman from Iowa's statement, is something that is an amalgam of a number of other bills, but it is something new. The interaction between the parts is new. And that for those of us who have spent some time dismantling and reassembling bills, it is going to take the Congressional Budget Office some time to examine this. It is not a minor modification of the Cooper Grandy. It's not a minor modification of Roland Bellarakis. There are parts that are similar, but that's true of a number of bills. And that we believe that given the attention and the desire to make sure that all positions are represented, that if it takes CBO a little longer to deal with our work product, since it is relatively new, we do not want to be prejudiced going to the floor, not having the full workup afforded to the other bills, uh, that this one should have so that the debate would be fair and equal, i.e. the level playing field in terms of discussion. You have a difficult job to do in writing a rule to cover something as uh, uh, immense uh, and uh, important as health care. I believe to err on the side of generosity in terms of time and the willingness to consider the issue is here the proper error to make. I do not think that the American people or the House should be deprived of a full and open airing. Detractors will say that this will lead to obfuscation and confusion. If there are limited hours, yes, that will be the case. If there are sufficient hours, you will find that there are enough members of goodwill who want to discuss substantive topics 
and compare differences so that everyone fully appreciates the choice they're making will be in a positive sense a contribution to this debate, both for informing the members as to their choices and for the American people to understand the gravity of some of the choices that this House is going to have to make on their behalf. So, Mr. Chairman, I would urge, along with my colleagues, that you be as generous as possible, both in terms of time for preparation for the debate and for uh, the time for the debate itself. And I thank the chairman, and I'm ready for any questions that someone might ask about the substance of the program. Thank you. Mr. Billinson. If, if I may, Mr. Chairman, a couple of things. First of all, um, and I say this in all seriousness, we, we have before us, as, as my colleagues up here know, four of the, of the most respected and thoughtful members of Congress. So that anything that you bring us, in all seriousness, is something which I think deserves the utmost consideration from us and from the members. And I hope and believe that it's our intention of, of making your work product available to all of our colleagues. I could not agree more uh, with, uh, than in fact I do, with, with our colleague, my colleague from California, Mr. Thomas's suggestions with respect to, to, to time. I believe the longer I sit up here listening to these things, the more I believe it. I happen to be one who believes that we ought to act this year on this subject matter, but I'm also, uh, along with you, Bill, uh, of the belief that we need to give plenty of time for this to play out for members as well as folks back home who will be watching certainly what goes on on the floor, plenty of time to understand the alternatives and the arguments and the issues and so on. I've been very impressed, as, as the chairman and some of our other colleagues have been sitting here for the past three days or so, a couple of days last week and again today, how much we, and we believe we've been, we're pretty much up to date on some of these things, have learned from many of our colleagues, including yourselves here today, about what's in these alternatives. It's important for all of our colleagues to have some an opportunity to do that, as well as I said, for the people back home. And, and I therefore believe that not only should we start off by giving the four or five hours that everyone's asking for for each each of the committees of jurisdiction to, to speak to, to what they've been doing or not doing in their own committees, I think then we have to set aside plenty of additional time, at least equivalent amount, for, for discussion on each of the various substitutes so that people get some ideas as to the distinctions between them, which ones you know include what others have and, and, and how, how the uh, how the differences uh, play out, because most of the members still don't have an awfully good understanding of that. Uh, none of you, none of you, did speak to the specifics of your of your proposal. I take it it's an amalgam, to a certain extent, of of the, of the two thoughtful proposals which the two groups had brought to to one another, the two basically bipartisan groups. Am I correct in in believing or understanding, Doctor Roy? We're all calling you Doctor today, but you still are a congressman. Well, we're proud to have you in our group. Um, that most of that most of what your your bill has in it has also been uh, uh, taken, if I may put it that way, by others in some of the larger bills. I mean, ha, am I correct in believing? Let me put it this way: uh, that that most folks agree with what you all are proposing, although the other alternatives, the so-called larger or more universal uh, alternatives, also have other things in them which you don't have. That's correct. Um, when we initially wrote the legislation, that is, Mike Velarakis and I, we looked at those pieces of legislation that were out there already and said, what is there among those pieces of legislation upon which there is general agreement? And we took from those pieces of legislation those areas where there was general agreement. We generally agreed that there needed to be some insurance reform, some malpractice reform, some antitrust reform, some administrative simplification, and some fraud and abuse reform. So we took those pieces uh, and put them together. Uh, in order to try to increase access uh, to health care in areas of our, of our country where there is not access, in the rural areas and inner city areas, uh, we proposed uh, expanding the concept of community health centers. So we added that to our legislation uh, as well. But then, of course, uh, the legislation that was proposed by Jim Cooper and Fred uh, Grandy took a somewhat different approach in that they moved towards managed uh, competition, managed concept type of delivery of health care. And so what we did was to merge these two pieces of legislation uh, together, taking from ours and from theirs and meeting uh, somewhere in the middle. So that is essentially uh, what we have done. Well, as I understand it, from what I've been reading at least, there are some differences from the original Cooper Grandy bill with respect to managed care as it's been put together in your bill. There have been some changes that have uh, been made in that. Uh, we did uh, remove the tax caps. Uh, they are not in this piece of legislation. That was a uh, very significant part of the Cooper Grandy bill, and I might. Uh, yeah, and a part that's. Uh, well, if, I, if, if I could just jump in here and, and kind of represent. The Cooper Grandy Bill, as it then was, 
in the Jurassic period of health care when we wrote this it. This is Mr. Grandy as he still is. Um, <laughs> we had a tax cap which we felt and some of us still believe is the best market driven cost containment discipline that you can find. But there is no appetite for that in Congress, Mr. Billinson, neither on your side nor, nor on ours. We had in the Cooper Grandy bill mandatory purchasing cooperatives for small businesses of employee size of 100 or less. There was no popularity for that concept either. Voluntary purchasing cooperatives are part of the uh, Roland Bill Rockus, Cooper Grandy, Thomas Stenholm iteration, and uh, that is pretty much market driven by the political marketplace now. People do not want to be shoved into cooperatives against their will. But it is also, I think, important to point out that we still agree as a group that we don't want government-imposed price controls. We do not want mandates to pay in health care. We do not want large government bureaucracies proliferating and, and uh, requiring certain benefits be offered. And that is uh, a difference, again, between what we have in our new coalition and what Cooper Grandy used to have. As you may recall, we specified that a commission would create a standard, standard benefit package, then send it back to Congress for an up or down vote. This group believes that the same uh, and perhaps greater choice can be accomplished by establishing an actuarial standard for a benefit package, using the guidelines in the Federal Employee Health Benefit Package to dictate what should be in or out of the package, but not specifying benefit by benefit what should be in to allow more choice in the marketplace. So uh, again, we have from the Cooper Grandy point of view, kind of surrendered more of the discipline in order to provide more choice and more, I shall say, I guess for want of a better term, more market-driven forces. And that is a consensus that reflects the entire group. Now, the trade-off for that is we don't get as many people covered as fast. We rely more on markets than mandates. And that, again, to this group, and I think to a lot of people that will support this bill, is an acceptable trade-off. The one thing I think to, to, to stress is we are not trying to be uh, Clinton Light or Mitchell Minus or Son of Gephardt or anything that is a kind of um, lowercase version of what's before you right now. This is a bill that does not profess to be all things to all people. It professes to be a bill that Americans can pay for and understand and accept and tolerate right now, and because of that, I think it certainly deserves to be mixed in with the other choices that are in front of you. I, just finally, I can tell you personally, um, it was difficult for me in this process to give up as much as I did and Jim Cooper did in this bill because we felt, as I'm sure many uh, people feel who've been involved in health care, that without our input on health care, the republic will collapse and there will be no health care and, and we'll all um, get sick and die. Sick and die. <laughs> uh, but part of this process is giving up what you realize are, are great ideas to, to kind of compromise towards a common good. And with that in mind, I think this is, this is a bill that is smaller, less ambitious, and less ambitious, but nonetheless as well-intentioned and more pragmatic and in touch with what Americans want right now. Uh, as you were describing your original bill, I was was sounding pretty good to me. I am sorry that you had to drop a couple of those major provisions. Well, if you could get the votes for him, Mr. Beal, <laughs> we wouldn't have to. I, I, I would tell you, Tony, the most difficult thing in this process was to take what you thought was right. Uh, Senator Chaffee and I started out with a universal coverage individual mandate bill which did not have employer mandates in which the president spoke favorably. In fact, Mr. Gephardt, during our Oxford debates, singled out this bill as, as a model that might be something that we, we could move toward. The benefit of this group is that we have, we have seen what, what the American public and our colleagues have said about other efforts, and we have filed it away. We, none of us got our druthers in this piece of legislation. Our druthers were the earlier work product, but they have fallen by the wayside. Some of those things, I think, actually, now that people are more educated, I'd love to be able to bring back like Lazarus. I don't think we're going to be able to do that. The National Governors Association has waded in with a list of uh, resolutions that, that, that we have taken into consideration. So the, the, the prime advantage of this bill, it is, it is the most recent iteration of where everyone has said is about as far as they can go if we're going to move a product. We are with you. We want to move a product this year. 
We believe this represents the best we can do in as many areas as we can with as much product as we can put in it that we can pass. And that's how it really came to fruition on a very frustrating process of mainly giving and not taking to produce a bill that we believe represents clearly the majority on the floor. Not a majority of the Republicans necessarily, not a majority of the Democrats. We hope a majority of both. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, may I ask one more question? Absolutely. I'm sorry, I don't mean to be taking up so much uh -huh. time, but it's, it's useful, and I think to all of us, and we have four particularly good people here who are able to educate us on this. I, I just would say parenthetically, I, I've, in this one area, I mean, the history has, has taught us that uh, market-driven forces don't work so well as they do in a lot of other areas. We've left it up to the market for the past hundred years or so, and that's part of our problem. So the fact that it's more market-driven than some other alternative doesn't necessarily give this, this member any confidence. Let me ask one more question as I, as I ask the Chairman's permission just now. Going back to what Charlie Stenholm spoke about, and something I guess that Fred Grandy brought up, that, that is, as, as none of us need to be reminded, uh, there were two big problems facing us in health care. It is, of course, a wonderful system in many respects for a great many Americans, but doesn't cover enough people. And at least, and it's importantly, in, in this member's opinion, I know some of your opinion too, uh, the problem of escalating costs has been a very great one. It's, it's bankrupting small businesses and families, which 15 years ago paid on average $800 for a, for a, for a health policy, health, health insurance policy for family of four, now has to pay $5,500 on average just 15 years later, and is bankrupting the federal government. It's the one area, the one big area of the federal government, of federal spending that's not under control. And that's true, of course, of, of uh, Medicaid at the state level um, as, as well. So my question to you is, um, what is there, what do you have in this bill at the moment which gives you some hope, gives all of us some hope with respect to keeping costs down? I happen to share Fred Grandy's view. I know it's politically unpopular. We probably wouldn't have 30 votes perhaps on the floor for it. Uh, I do believe we should have those, those tax caps. I, I, uh, it was one of the best things in that original bill. And, but maybe just politically it won't work at this point. But what, what is there in your proposal, doctor, and others that, that holds out some hope to us all that, uh, that costs might be, might, might be slowed if, if we adopted your your, your proposal? We believe that market forces will be the thing that will do this. Are these new we, market forces different from the ones we used to well, have let that me didn't make, work? Let me make a comment about sure. that. Your comments earlier were exactly right. I can tell you as a practicing physician that when someone came to the hospital with a member of their family that was sick, they wanted the best. They didn't care what it cost. They didn't want a Chevrolet. Uh, kind of care, or they didn't want a medium price appliance kind of care. They wanted the very best. So you're exactly right in saying that market forces don't really apply in health care to the same extent that they do in other areas. But what we uh, have put in place here is a look back after a period of five years and see whether or not we are really moving towards the goal that we want to achieve or the cost of care uh, really being uh, held down. Uh, we have uh, these volunteer alliances, uh, health plan purchasing organizations. We trust that there will be some competition among the providers of insurance uh, that will help to hold down the cost of this insurance. We don't know that for sure, but we believe that if there is competition, uh, that that will help, uh, help, help to hold down the cost of care. Uh, I, I, for one, believe that uh, the malpractice problem adds a significant amount to the cost of uh, care. Uh, so we do have some malpractice reform as well. Antitrust reform where groups uh, and communities uh, can come together and put in place a health care delivery system which delivers care more efficiently and effectively without violating antitrust laws uh, is something that uh, we believe will hold down the cost of care as well. Administrative simplification. I know that administration is one of the things that adds a great deal of, of cost to, uh, to the uh, health care scenario that we have. Uh, the cost of administration with some insurance companies 15, 20, or 25 percent. So we believe that some innovation uh, in that area as well. And of course, there's a significant amount of uh, abuse and fraud of the present system. So uh, we believe that those are the kind of things that, uh, that will help to hold down uh, the cost of care. I, for one, do not believe in price controls. I remember very well President Nixon's economic stabilization program that was in place for 32 months in the early 70s and what happened uh, with that. So uh, my opinion is that we need to look at those things that are out there that uh, may help to hold down the cost of care and take a look back and see if it really is effective. One quick look back, one, one quick follow-on question please. With respect to your f five-year look back, um, 
<coughs> what happens after five years? Just looking back, but there's nothing that goes into effect. It. I take it at that time. Well, the, the, the prices uh, haven't moderated. There will have to be recommendations made to the Congress about what should be done at that particular time. I don't think that we can dictate in the future what future Congresses uh, should do, but there needs to be a look back and see whether or not we are moving towards universal coverage, whatever that happens to be. And I'm not sure what percent of the population that would have insurance that happens to be. I suspect we'll be looking back every year, frankly, because we're just going to have to track what happens with health care costs to us as... Well, in fact, we do look back uh, with respect to the uh, privatizing of the acute uh, care part of Medicaid. We look back every year, and we cannot exceed uh, every year uh, increasing, uh, expanding uh, the purchase of insurance for these uh, low-income people if the revenues are not there to do it. Uh, Mr. Bielenson, if I could, as a at least a, a shadow supporter of a tax cap, you will appreciate a provision we did put in to the market side of this bill, which is in a, a provision called the level contribution, which would require of employers who do pay for a portion of their health care to make the same proportional contribution for all the plans that they offer. So in other words, if I employ you and you want a standard benefit package and the actuarial value of that package is $2,100 and I provide $1,500 worth of cost sharing and the chairman wants a high deductible plan um, with uh, the same benefits but higher deductibles and more copay so he can keep more uh, cash and perhaps transfer that to a medical savings account, I have to make the same contribution, the same dollar amount to his plan as I do to yours. And that way, employers cannot kind of adversely select among their own policies and, and kind of favor either cheaper policies or Cadillac policies, depending on, on how they want to drive their workforce. That is, of course, not a tax cap, but it does impose a discipline on the growth of what employers can provide. And that, as, you know, given, given the climate of, of anti-taxation and, and concerns about what a tax cap might do to benefits that are already in place, that is a kind of cost containment mechanism which I think the public will allow. I would also say that we are attempting to put some brakes not on just Medicaid, as the doctor pointed out, but, but Medicare, in that we are encouraging uh, by lifting some of the regulations on Medicare so that you can uh, risk contract with Medicare, put Medicare populations into managed care networks. I know your state has had some success with that. So we have some disciplines as they relate to the public programs. But in most cases, we try to say, without price controls or employer mandates or tax caps, you pretty much have to watch, see what the market does. And it should be brought up at this point that the market has responded by decreasing yes. the amount of health care costs and medical inflation, if you believe what's happened over the last few years. We believe that trend will continue with a proper government oversight. Well, your, your comments make me feel a little bit better. I just don't want us to lose the fact that, that one, of the, one of the reasons we got into this into this argument, this debate in the first place, is that we've, we've got to find a way to control costs. And I'm, I'm worried about all of the bills, frankly, whether any of them, you know, will, will actually do it. And I suspect you're right. We, we have to keep the pressure on. We have to keep everybody's attention on this matter. At least so long as we do that, things seem to be, moder be moderating a bit. Whether or not we can construct uh, a, a system that in and of itself will, will lead to, to moderation of, uh, of health care costs is, I guess, we still don't know. Mr. Bielsen, along that line, I would encourage you to examine closely the CBO scoring of all of the bills. And if our current estimates are correct, we will increase the cost less by far than any other. But proposal. you may not extend it to as many additional people. That's part of the problem. But you know. there again, you have to consider, as Dr. Rowland has observed on many, many occasions, you can have the best insurance program in the world, but if people do not have as to health care, what are you going to do with your insurance? Just the fact that we provide a costly program does not necessarily give us the quality of health care that everyone would seek. And one of the things that we have tried in our approach is to recognize that we got into this, some of us at least, the, the major reason for health system reform was cost. And you remember the, the, the discussion and the debate regarding the budget in which everyone was saying we have to postpone until health care reform before we, in fact, can deal with the rest of the budget deficit. Now, unfortunately, no one is talking about any of the health care bills reducing the deficit. 
that is a problem that we have. But I believe you will find that ours offers the best hope of gaining control of the cost escalation and will do so without tremendously increasing the overall cost. That's one of the problems that I've had all along with the so-called employer mandate. Creating a new program, a new idea of how we're going to provide health care and passing the cost on to someone else. <coughs> would, my, not... would my chairman allow me to ask one more very quick question? Don't apologize. Well, I'm that still going to answer your other one, so keep going. And, and the, final, the final observation I would make is just underlying what Mr. Grandy said. Look, look at what's already happened to the market escalation cost as a result of the fact that the Congress is looking at doing something about health system Congress. reform. We're already seeing the dramatic effects. And I'll share with you one little conversation that I had in my office one year ago last January with a board of directors of a lar very large hospital chain that was in my office. And among the things they said that day, they pri pr proudly announced that they were going to reduce their overhead costs this year, meaning 1993, by 17%. To which I asked the question, great, why didn't you do it last year? To which they honestly responded, we didn't have to, no one was looking. Sure, now, right. that is the system in which we have evolved. This third party pay syndrome in which most of the American people believed up until just recently that if our insurance paid for it, once we get through the deductible, it's free. Or if Medicaid pays for it, it's free. Or if Medicare pays for it, it's free. We're now beginning to realize, all 260 million of us, that health care is not free. And if we cannot build ourselves incrementally into understanding each and every one of us from the poorest of the poor to the richest of the rich that there is a cost associated with health care, we're going to fail to solve the problem. But I believe you will find that the market-oriented direction is much better than any government-created intervention that we can ever come up with. And you probably remind us that even if we succeed in passing a bill this year, we should keep introducing bills every year to keep the community, the health care community, moderating its prices out of fear that we might do something worse to them. My final question is, and, and Bill, maybe you can answer this and, and or the other one if you want. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Is Mr. Solomon. Wait, no, I have, no, that wasn't my, he, he answered something oh, my old sorry. Way, but I still have my new question to okay. ask. As a believer, as I think all of us are, an individual responsibility, both in terms of, you know. 40 minutes. Well, yeah, but it's been very interesting. We, you've been learning something, haven't you? Because I've been asking questions, and they've been answering them well. I think they've been very germane. Trying to help our... Thanks. I won't ask any of the next witness. But one final one of this. We all believe in individual responsibility, and particularly in this case. And, Doctor, you've had some experience, I'm sure. I happen to be, be one who believes in, in co-payments and deductibles and having each individual responsible to a certain, even very limited extent if necessary, only a dollar, five dollars, three dollars, to have some financial participation, uh, participation in whatever whenever a care one, one seeks. Does yours, is there any way of, of, of we, describing whether or not your bill suggests that? We have a fundamental commitment that? that the idea that you have just espoused is one of the keys to making sure that people buy only the health care that they need. And the best way to do that is to get them involved in the decision making. Part of it is the product that's been offered in the past uh, in the insurance and the way in which it's been marketed. And we offer a number of alternatives, including uh, something, frankly, we think uh, for some people is a very good idea, and that's the so-called MetaSave account, in which individuals can clearly see the consequences of their decision. But, but in the past as well, government has involved itself far more than we would like to admit. And when you say that you've seen market forces working, Tony, I think what you need to do is take a look at the way in which the government controlled that marketplace as much as it did in perverse ways. I still agree with you that market forces alone won't resolve it, but we've got to change the relationship of uh, the insurance industry and the marketing of that product and the way in which government oversees it. We try to do that in probably the most realistic way possible. You talked about the coverage. We believe low income simply don't have sufficient dollars to participate in the system. Given the understanding that we can't front load it with a lot of taxes, we do expand the coverage, I think, in an honest way and in a way in which millions of Americans will now have insurance that they couldn't have afforded otherwise. There are some people out there that haven't bought insurance simply because they don't have a product that fits their particular needs. I'm thinking of young people in their 20s who don't need this massive broad-based package. They have been left out of the marketing by and large. 
with the volunteer cooperatives for both individuals and small business that we're allowing <coughs> states to create that California now has that's very successful. They will have a marketing structure with a product that meets their needs. That's going to help expand it. I'm very concerned about the cost controls in this measure. We had an individual mandate. We had the tax cap uh, on deductions in our bill as well. That's an unacceptable option. Don't dismiss the structure that Fred Grandy explained to you too lightly. If the employer has a fixed dollar amount, and that fixed dollar amount, $1,500 or $2,000, would pay 100% of a very modest package and only 80% of that super Cadillac plan, more and more employees, because of the level contribution requirement by the employer, will decide, I don't need that extra stuff if it's going to come out of my pocket. I'll go with that other program that's completely covered by the employer's dollars. That is a significant private sector cost control mechanism imposed by government. But ultimately, it is the consumer and the knowledge we're going to provide them through the changes in this bill, and frankly, other bills have it as well, which will allow that consumer to be no more knowledgeable and deliver a product that they can compare product to product, which they can't do now. And clearly, after five years or more, there are going to have to be adjustments. I think it makes no sense, after all the hearings that I've heard about the downsides of experiments and unanticipated consequences, to try to impose something clear into the year 2004 or 5 and dictate and mandate that these things are going to occur. We make the changes that need to be made, that everybody agrees needs to be made. In fact, we're also fairly creative, as the doctor said, with Medicaid. We privatize it. We give the states the option of moving them more into a managed care structure that lets the federal government spell it, spend its dollars smartly. And then we will sit back and come and say, what needs fine-tuning? What needs adjustments? What areas did we not anticipate need to be covered? We are not going to pass one bill and walk away from it, as you well know. We're going to have to come back and adjust. Let's do the things we need to do now and then together address the problems that are clearly going to be more uh, magnified by the success in solving some of the others. So there are a lot of things in this bill that need to be done. I don't think we do uh, some of the novel or experimental things that other bills try to do. I thank my chairman and my friends. But the, but the short answer to your question, so long. short answer to your question is yes. What was Co-insurance, <laughs> if I recall your question right. was, do you have co-pays in the bill? Yes. And, and in addition to co-insurance and high deductibles, co-pays, meaning you reach into your pocket and pay something every time you go to right. the doctor, would apply for everybody, whether they are getting a Cadillac plan or they're coming to their doctors on a pogo stick, would have to reach in and pay for something, except in the case of preventive care. We are trying to encourage behavior that says, get your kids immunized. Sounds good. Get, get screening for mammograms, those kind of things. No copay there. But everywhere else you pay, no matter where you are on the income spectrum. It's proportional, but you pay. Uh, let the record show that the Honorable Dennis Hastert has uh, joined the group. This time I'd like to ask unanimous consent to put the statement of Congressman Jim Moran into the record. Any objection? The chair has none. No objection. Gentleman <coughs> from New York, Mr. Solomon. Uh, Mr. <coughs> Chairman, let me um, first of all uh, announce that uh, Congressman Denny Hastert's plane didn't land till about 4 and it was late and so he finally arrived. Uh, the same problem is, uh, I understand, is with Mr. Bill Arrakis. So he couldn't be here either. Uh, listening to the uh, to the testimony and some of the questions, I just uh, I just have to say that we all have to be concerned about cost uh, and how we uh, and we I think we have to be so extremely careful in in how we squeeze uh, the delivery system in this country uh, and worry about how we might end up with inferior medicine. You know, I was the ranking Republican on the Veterans Affairs Committee with, for many years, served with my good friend Roy Rowland. And uh, even back in the, uh, the Reagan-Bush years, uh, the uh, office of OMB came up with this, uh, this policy that uh, we were going to, to uh, make the VA medical care delivery system a much better system, and we were going to squeeze productivity out of them. And so we cut their budget by a percentage every year for a number of years. Uh, and wanted them to make it up with productivity, and we damn near ruined the system. Right, Roy? Right. So, you know, whatever we do, uh, and one of you gentlemen mentioned earlier that we need to, we need to 
try to fix what's broken without disrupting the finest medical care delivery system in the world, uh, a system that is the envy of the world. And I know because my district borders Canada, and uh, I see what happens day after day after day. So l let me just go back to uh, what Roy and, uh, and Fred mentioned uh, about getting fair treatment. And, uh, uh, you know, your, your plan probably right now, I would uh, venture to guess, has more votes than any of the others. And here are the, the, the eight others right here. And certainly your plan is entitled to the same consideration uh, as the major Democrat plan, as the major Republican plan. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, if we really want to diminish uh, and minimize the, the partisanship that is, you know, inevitably out there, the best way to do that, and I mentioned that at the opening of our hearing several days ago, would be to take this bipartisan plan, which is an extensive plan, uh, and is a consensus, Charlie, which you mentioned, um, of, of what was uh, uh, perhaps acceptable and good out of all of these proposals here, and make that the base text of the bill, and then allow the Democrat uh, uh, substitute, the alternative, to be offered to it, and to allow the Republican alternative to be offered to it, or the, the single payer. That would be the fair way, and the American people would understand that. Now, uh, having said all that, I've, I've looked at all these plans and, uh, and uh, tried to decide what I would vote for in a plan. And I have about eight things, which I'll just ask you about your plan to see if it, if it meets that criteria to, to get a vote like mine, which is, uh, I think, typical perhaps of the, uh, the rank-and-file Republicans and, and probably a great many of the Democrats as well. Uh, yours mentioned, uh, and just to get specific in answer with a yes or no, yours does carry portability for those people that would change job or lose jobs? Absolutely. The answer is yes. yes. You carry uh, pre-existing conditions for the same reasons for people that might change yes. jobs or lose their jobs? Yes. yes. The answer is yes. You allow total tax deductions for insurance uh, premium and out-of-pocket medical expenses? For self-employed self and for employers any other business it is now. Coverages for other people. Uh, for, for full disclosure on what our bill does over time, we were not able to grant that up front 100%. We do uh, within a window of time simply because there isn't enough money up front. But ultimately, by the year 2000, you yes, self-employed get 100% deductibility of their medical expenses. Yes. yes. Excellent. Uh, you do, uh, you have really meaningful tort reform so that we don't have... The best of any bill. The best of any one of them. And that's, and that's uh, most of the think tanks say that about your bill, as I understand it. Okay. Well, since some don't have any, it's easy to stay here. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> of, those, of those that have tort reform, yes, we I have the best. Right. You do require uh, insurance companies to make uh, group policies available to, uh, to everyone. Yes. yes. Uh, if you offer it to one, you have to yeah. offer it to all. Well, that, that's tremendous. That's, that's guaranteed really, issue. That's required. Yeah. Guaranteed that, issue. That's required. Uh, you have uh, uh, absolute uh, uh, choice of doctors. Matter of fact, yes, you do. And that's you have, guaranteed. You have a guaranteed choice of, of policies, and you have a guaranteed choice of people who provide the services. Right. And they can go HMO, they can go managed, they can go anything. Or, or Fee for service. Private doctors. Absolute choice. Once again, in terms of truth and packaging, if in fact they wish that, at times they may have to pay for it. Uh, if you're going to have that option, that sometimes makes it more expensive. And if you want to pay for it, you get it. We don't preclude it, but we also don't give somebody something for free. I, I don't want anyone to think that we do something that someone else can't do for free with smoke and mirrors. We do not. The option is there, but if you choose that option, it will cost more. One other concern <clears throat> that many of us had is the, uh, the preservation of the, of the Medicare system for, for the elderly. Uh, you do not in any way open up Medicare to younger people and you don't create a Medicare Part C and at no. all? No, in fact, we take uh, Medicaid and defederalize it, privatize mm -hmm. it, take a lot of people, particularly people on Medicaid age. for the poor. Yes, right. well, for Medicaid, yeah. Medicaid for the elderly, the long-term mm -hmm. care portion of Medicaid right. is not touched in this bill. Right. We refer only to the acute care portion and, and even maintain uh, people on SSI and the disabled portions in a public program. But AFDC and non-cash eligibles who in many cases, Mr. Solomon, are healthy, as healthy or healthier 
yep. than low-income individuals seeking right. subsidies are going to be mainstreamed into the system. That is not different from Senator Mitchell's bill. And last, uh, my criteria is you do not require employer mandates. No. Period. There is a mandate to offer insurance, but not to fund. Right. That is just the same as it is, for I'm example, in the mandate Michael on the private sector right. on, on, right. on business. Right. Well, I'm going to tell you, gentlemen, I think you have a plan which, um, if it were allowed, if we don't go king of the hill, and if, uh, if the one with the vote, vote, most votes win, uh, your, your vote, your, your bill would be the one that would have the most support in this Congress, I believe. Gentlemen, you'll briefly, once to. again, when we say we don't require an employer mandate, that does not mean then that we turn loose every employer that has a current responsibility that they voluntarily arrived at with their employees. We require a maintenance of effort of those employers who are out there. This is no recess to back away from any commitment that you have with your employees in terms of health care. So while we say we don't impose a mandate on employers, we do require a maintenance of effort of those who have voluntarily made a commitment to their employees. Just one uh, last question. You've met certainly my, my eight criteria, but uh, uh, debate time on this issue. Uh, you know the problems that we're going to have getting your bill scored. Uh, to get it reconsidered <coughs> after uh, the Gephardt final version is finally finally scored. That's going to take days and days and days. Um, I would just hope that this committee, this rules committee, would uh, eventually put out uh, a rule allowing for general debate and put out a rule which will make in order whatever we're going to do. But then making that uh, uh, available to the press, to the journals, journalistic uh, uh, media, uh, and let us go home and let us present these plans to our constituents. My constituents are so confused over this issue. Uh, the eight criteria I've just mentioned to you are what I hear most about. That's what their concerns are. And they don't know what's in these bills, and they really aren't going to know. But uh, let me yield to my good friend, Denny Haspel, well, who hasn't had a chance to speak. appreciate you the gentleman from New York yielding, but it's one of the criteria I think we need to uphold on this thing and ha take these, bill these bills back, let people read them, let them understand them, let the debate go forward in the public sector, and uh, let people compare the, what the options are. And I think it's really uh, very, very important that people have time to digest this and to see what the differences are. And uh, so that we get the signals when we go back home as people representing them as well. And uh, it's going to take a while, I think, once these uh, bills are out there in the public and scored and uh, for people to start to really tug them apart and look at them and see what the relative values are. It's very important that we have some time to do that. Uh, if and when we, we get to this debate, uh, how much uh, de general debate time? Just suppose we make an order for of these substitutes. Suppose we make an order the uh, the bipartisan your your bill. We make an order the re Democrat uh, substitute the Republican and maybe the single payer, and hopefully we might do more. But suppose we made an order those four. How much general debate time do you think there ought to be on the floor uh, before we get into the actual time allocated to each individual substitute? I think there ought to be at least a couple of days of, of general debate on those issues so we can start to lay the parameters and define the packages for what they are and uh, so that it can start to sink in and people you know, start to analyze those issues that are, are representative of each of the four or five packages or whatever you put out. Uh, so I think it's, a, it's important that we have a couple of days of general debate so people can start to understand you know, where those uh, parameters are. Well, you know, the worst thing in the world we could do is to uh, <clears throat> get into a situation which we even do on terribly important issues like the defense authorization bill, which is a very complicated matter. And we end up with, uh, with limited debate where members are out there speaking for one minute and two minutes. And that doesn't solve any purpose at all. We need to have a real debate on this issue. And if we do have two days of debate, uh, that means that there's going to be ample time so that we can have a full discussion and not have 435 members. And you know every single member is going to want to stand up and talk uh, uh, for some uh, uh, length of time. Mr. But, Tom, on that point, and it came out in both the subcommittee and the committee hearings in Ways and Means, if you limit the time, uh, and I have a half an hour or an hour, inevitably it turns out like a lot of campaigns, and that is I'm going to have to spend my time trashing the other person's bill and then briefly talking about mine. 
And that is an inevitability. And what you need is time for the disassembling, the dismantling, the criticisms of others, and then a discussion of the substantive pieces, and then a putting back together so that I have time to explain why mine is better than the other person's on the way in which it goes together. That is simply a function of time. If you have two or three hours, you will have a lot of haranguing and trashing of other people's positions. If you have several days, you will get that inevitably a small part of it. But then you have more time to talk about why ours is better than theirs and why this provision works better than their provision. And that's the enlightening and education aspect that I think is critical for us to go for. Well, I will just say to you, gentlemen, that uh, our friend from Florida down at the far end has been very patient here today. Uh, is going to be uh, negotiating that time for uh, the Republican side. And I would hope that, uh, that uh, all four of you, as a matter of fact, all ten of you, uh, will talk with the Republican Democrat leadership to make sure that we are going to be able to have that ample time. I'm not going to take up any more of your time. I really appreciate your coming. I'm sick of seeing you in the hallways around here at midnight. Um, hopefully this will, uh, will be resolved in the near future, and I appreciate all the hard work you all have done. Thank you. Mr. Goss. Thank you very much, Mr. Milson. Uh, Mr. Haster, did you want your uh, remarks submitted for the record? I would like to have leave to put my opening statement or my remar that remarks in the restaurant. So, that objection so the, uh, And I would also say I hope, uh, please apologize for my lateness. I did have, my plane was delayed, and uh, I'm happy to be here. At least you and your part. plane are both forgiven. Uh, thank M you. Mr. Chairman, I would also ask that other members who are not here be allowed to place their remarks objection. on the Any member who well. has a prepared statement will have it inserted in the record at this point in the record. Thank you. Thank um, you, Mr. Goss. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I just wanted to be sure that uh, Mr. Hastert, if he had other remarks that he wanted, was offered that opportunity because he, he wasn't here, and I've been subject to a late plane. We all have before. Just, just a very right. brief statement. I know you've listened to us for hours here, but, you know, ma many of us on this, of the 10 uh, that have worked on this bill have been working on health care for two or three years, and it's com immensely complex. And I think we all had something in common, that we took the approach and we tried to find out what the problems were in the healthcare system, instead of just designing a new system. And then tried to come back and, and methodically trying to address uh, answers to those problems. And I think this bill that you have before us, and the bipartisan bill, is an extremely fine example of people trying to analyze problems and fix what's broken in a common sense, straightforward way. And I think it's a very unique approach. Uh, it's one of the most amazing things I've worked on uh, since I've been here. And I hope that we have uh, enough time to explain it and, and really get it out to the public. And I really appreciate your time and uh, listening to us today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, uh, I've looked at the question of the management of the time a little bit that uh, you all have spoken to and under different formula, and uh, I don't know what the formula of the Rules Committee will be. We obviously haven't got to that part. We're still doing a uh, hearing and intake on the very many uh, creative ideas and suggestions and substitutes and amendments that have come forward to us, and I understand we've got more to go. Um, I've calculated that the, the best possible uh, you could hope for uh, is if everybody got a chance to speak, we all got a chance to understand what it was we were talking about, and it could make an informed vote. I don't know how long that would take, but uh, <laughs> if we break it down into uh, general debate, and, and uh, even took as big a chunk of time as 25 hours, which sounds like a big chunk of time, not every member gets a chance to talk. There will be committees that are left out. There will be subjects that will be shortchanged. Uh, it's inevitable. And then when you add to 25 hours of debate, uh, say four or five substitutes, you're debating those, and you'll be going over some same ground, and there you really will be doing matching cards, where you get this with this and you get this with the other, uh, and that will be a very intense uh, issue to issue or point to point type debate, and you allow for two days of that. Uh, you've, you've used the working week around here, a long working week, and you probably still haven't got the job done. So the management of time is going to be a very, very important decision made by this committee, whether we'll do it on an issue basis, a block basis, a committee basis, uh, I don't know. But I think that uh, we need to think of those considerations. And I'm glad we've had a chat a little bit about the rule beside the substance. On your bill, the thing that, uh, your, your amendment, the thing that, of course, uh, I think is um, very important is it goes to the three themes that we've heard in all 
that are going to be the themes that the American people are going to ask us debate, the themes of uh, access, the themes of choice, uh, and the themes of cost. And I think that the bipartisan substitute, and obviously I have a bias and I'm very candid and admit it, really does a better job uh, addressing those at the understanding level that we all have and the American people have right now of where we are and what we need. I think the bipartisan bill focuses on the 15 percent of the problem, I think Charlie Stenholm said it well, and, and leaves pretty much intact the people who are happy, the other 85 percent or whatever that number is that are out there. And I think that's a very important point and a very important distinction. Uh, it's less risky and it has more surefire results that are going to be benefits. I think it's another way of saying that. Um, and then Mr. Bielenson brought up the question, which is a very fair one, about the marketplace, trusting the marketplace. And I make a point, and I, I'm quite serious about this, Tony. We looked at this a lot in this group. And there is a, a difference when you come into the emergency room. It's a little late to start worrying about market forces at that point. You're into cost shift by then. But when you're talking into prepaid policies, then you are giving people choices and incentives. Uh, and true, we do have some co-pays in this for non-preventative things and some incentives that uh, make people do the right things. But th the important point is we, we try and get to people uh, ahead of the problem and say, make a choice, here's an opportunity, here's an incentive to do this. And I think that is um, a, a major step forward in the kind of thinking that we really need to be doing on this. Um, when we, we come to uh, the Medicaid section, we've talked about it a little bit. We've had three different testimonies that I'm aware of today on Medicaid, and I may have missed a few before I got here, how you deal with it. This is the most innovative, and I think this is the one that will save the most money in Medicaid before we get through because it's got some incentives to save some money. Uh, that's very important. The other is sort of prolong the problem or amend the problem further into the future. And I think this one steps up to the, the plate and attacks it. And I think those kinds of things are, are going to be hard to explain, but are going to be exactly the kinds of things that the people in this country are asking us to do. The final area, of course, the seniors coming from Florida. I can't not mention seniors. Um, and I was very concerned when we started this process that we all know everybody's going to have to sacrifice some, and you're never going to get just what you want. But we've come up with, with a pretty good approach, I think, to better care uh, that is certainly the la causes the least anxiety of anything I've seen so far we're talking about now, and it's the most thoughtful. We have now Medicare Select with our PPSs. We have the opportunity for people on Medicare to deal with a prescription drug problem uh, through uh, the PPS program that's included in this bipartisan bill, which I think is great. Uh, we require the states to, to offer that option. Now, I think that kind of stuff uh, is going to allow people who have got a good thing now to say, hey, I can make this a little better and I'm not worried about anybody taking anything away from me. And I think the Medicaid approach is innovative uh, and, and it gets to another part of the spectrum that way. So I think we do have some, some cost containment in here that's very hard to understand, very hard to, under, to explain until we sit down and have a session like this. Now, are we going to have an opportunity to have a session like this? No. You know darn well we're not. Uh, we're going to be up against a deadline of some type. Uh, and that's why it's going to be very important that when we do make this rule that we carve as much time as we can so these kinds of discussions can take place because I know that there just isn't going to be enough time. Uh, and as much as we get, it's still not going to be enough. So I'm going to I'm going to list you on our side, I hope, of trying to get as much as we can get. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate yeah, Mr. that. Mr. Chairman, Thank you. just Mr. from Grandy. a historical perspective, does the chair know or does any member of the committee know how much time was allotted to the original original debate on Medicare, and for that matter, Medicaid, because this is of equal import. I, I, and I, I would think that given the inflation important. factor for time and money that has happened yeah. since 1965, you should start with that as your base and inflate generously. Uh, and use that perhaps to determine how much time you set on the rule. Because just, just glancing back, it was, it was several days. And, uh, yeah. Could have been a good well, point. I rest my case. I, I think that if we cannot at least do for the health care system in the 1990s, which was purported to be done just for seniors in the 1960s, then we have not served the American public well. Mr. Chairman, a little mathematical trivia. If every member speaks five minutes, it takes 36 hours and 15 minutes to debate any issue that we have before the House. 
pretty good trivia. Yes, we can think of a hundred or more. Yes, yeah. that's a that's a, a that's a good reason for close rule, I think. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, most of the discussion about the rule has been on the time, and I think appropriately so. But the gentleman from New York mentioned something which uh, I think needs to be addressed. He indicated that he would be uh, supportive of allowing the bipartisan bill to be the base bill. Um, okay. Frank, the ranking member has got all kinds of plans for rules. Unfortunately, <laughs> it's not his party that determines the rules. And wait that, till, and, wait and, till next year. And <laughs> that's why I want to address that. Uh, I would most gleefully grab that unfair advantage and run with it, but it would either be in a dream or uh, uh, having died and gone to heaven and offer there. And I'm in the Rules Committee, so I know it's not a realistic offer. So I can't take it. But the converse, I think, of that is absolutely important for you people in the majority to consider. To conversely construct a rule which gives the Democrat plan, the clinton Gephardt plan, an unfair advantage so that the American people see votes on various options and a vote that had more for it than a vote that comes later for another plan and the later plan wins is going to be impossible to explain. We've talked about the difficulty of explaining health care. Mr. Chairman, I would implore you and the members of your party, this has got to be a fair fight. If you set up a rule which stacks the procedure to give an unfair advantage to any bill, if you offered me the unfair advantage that the gentleman from New York offered, and by declining it, it would be a declination of your ability to have an unfair advantage as well, I would take that in a minute. So please, Mr. Chairman, the time is important, but the fundamental rule which treats everyone equal and allows the House to work its will and the and the bill that and the and the bill that gets the most votes wins is i think the most important part of the rule that you write but i th <clears throat> i think most people miss the point that the, on the king of the hill it's the substitute going against the standing uh substitute so it's not that every substitute goes against the base bill and so therefore uh, it, it's the one that is remained standing because it, it's beaten uh, the last bill that was before it. And that is an unfair advantage by defining the shape of the table and the structure of debate. Why can't we simply consider each of these and then determine which one wins? If you want to have a base bill, then obviously I think we, representing a far broader base, ought to have that unfair advantage. <laughs> well. The gentleman would, uh, would yield on that subject. Uh, I don't think you were here, but um, uh, I don't often agree with the editorials of the, of the New York Times, I said. But here's an editorial from the New York Times bill that says exactly what you just said. In other words, let the chips fall where they may. It's an excellent editorial. I'll make sure you all get a copy of it. It's uh, Sunday, August 14th. I want to thank you, gentlemen, for a very, very good presentation. And as Mr. Billington said, it was uh, very educational, and, and uh, we really did uh, learn a lot from your plan. As of the moment, I don't know what time we're going to uh, alert. I don't even know when we're going to start uh, putting the thing together. We're just having in the hearing process now. But uh, uh, having said that, I really appreciate your coming here today and giving you this great testimony. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Doc. Thank you. Thank you for your All right, Bill. Thank you. Who's next? Okay. The uh, chair will recognize the uh, congressman from Ohio, the Honorable James Traficant. I filed the rule. Mr. Chairman, one amendment would give another to all the people getting any money under this act. Uh, will you under please excuse act. me? I have to get down to the floor for a minute. Be fine, Chairman. Okay. I would hope that you'd uh, review the testimony, though, and give consideration to the amendment. The sheriff. I'll, I'll, I'll fill in the. Appreciate it. I'll fill in the chair. First one is an amendment that would give a notice for all the money under this bill, encouraging people to buy American. But the significant amendment, Mr. Chairman, deals with the fact the studies show that 20 percent or more of total medical costs go to maintain our current record-keeping system. 
and the average hospital shuffles five million pieces of paper a year, and a health card may be inevitable. This amendment deals with the health card, Chairman. And I'd ask to be made in order to any of the bills that may, in fact, produce a new record-keeping system which may involve the card. There are right now no federal laws that protect the privacy of medical records except those related to treatment for drug and alcohol abuse and psychiatric care. And few states have any privacy laws. And a health card that may be developed could be highly abused. For example, employers could discover that your family has a history of heart disease and decide not to take you on as an employee. And at other times, the government might, in fact, for other reasons, intrude into the matter and a card could be abused. My amendment would first, the health card and the social security card will be combined into a dual purpose card. Second, all persons with access to medical or social security information would have a feature in their system that would block personal identifiers as well as block the use of social security or medical benefits should an individual qualify for one or the other. And third, based on the principle that people have the right to control information about themselves, information collected for one purpose would not be used for another purpose. As a result, Chairman, there are no federal privacy laws to protect individuals. The amendment also calls that there is much abuse of the Social Security system by fraudulent Social Security cards. This amendment would also require that at age 18 that the dual purpose card would have to have the photograph of the individual and there'd be but one number. So in essence, whatever the bill is, there will be a maintenance of records provision. More than likely, even though the good chairman from New York, Mr. Solomon, may not want to discuss Medicare Part C, that, in fact, could be a part of a national policy in this country. In any event, this would give the authority to the Social Security Administration to go ahead, develop a dual-purpose card, issue those cards, put the blockers in them, and, in fact, bid for a service that would be the database control that's most cost-effective. Now, finally, the amendment calls for a study and provides for an analysis of the different database companies and how this service can be converted to individual use and also to instruct the Congress on the best way that such a program can be implemented. So an analysis of projected participation and the cost of the government would also be provided from that analysis. So in essence, it deals more with the card, a federal privacy law to deal with this important information. It can be abused and can, in fact, hurt the American people. It would eliminate the fraudulent use of stolen Social Security cards by the calling for and requirement of a photograph. And the Social Security Administration would have to devise that. A study would be then put into effect to provide the best way. And finally, again, there are no federal laws protecting privacy. And this amendment would, in fact, provide that. And I would ask that for those bills that in fact create such an opportunity for a database card, that such a card, this amendment be made in order subject to those provisions where a card might in fact become a reality. Thank you, Jim. Excellent proposal, excellent amendment, although obviously it's a complicated thing and perhaps needs some changes in it. It deserves more discussion than we're going to give you now only because we've only got five minutes left to get down on the floor. I know that, Chairman. But it's an extremely important point that you bring up and I agree with you completely that we've got to we've got to ensure that uh, anything we may end up with uh, has got something very similar to what you're proposing as part of it. Chairman, I think in conference they would take this and they can tailor it. That's not the point. But there's no federal oh, privacy well, laws. It, 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 it should go in before conference. And it should I would, go in on the floor. Yes, and I would ask that before. it be discussed because we may end up with a card system. Right. Mr. Solomon. <clears throat> Jim, we appreciate you coming before us. Your uh, amendment certainly deserves uh, consideration on the floor. I hope we can take care of you. Let me just briefly uh, mention, because we are short of time, 
my concerns about Medicare. You know, uh, when I look at what happened to Social Security over the years, Franklin Roosevelt had a great idea when he came up with the, with the supplemental Social Security uh, supplemental retirement system so that people through a forced savings account would be able to put away a little bit of money being forced to do it through the Social Security system and then be able to get that money back over a period of time with monthly payments. Um, after years and years went by, this Congress saw fit to keep adding things into that system. And if you look at the chronological order of all of those additions, you know, we just literally almost ruined the system. I don't want to see that happen to Medicare. Medicare is for the elderly. And they are like veterans. Veterans, you know, who service, uh, who receive uh, war injuries where they lose limbs or they lose organs, have a different kind of illness perhaps than the average American citizen out there. Same with older people. They lose limbs, they lose organs, uh, they have Alzheimer's, and they ought to be treated separately uh, with this Medicare system. I don't want to see that system op opened up to younger people. I think it ought to be kept there so that they can depend on it, and we should not be touching that, whatever else we do with the system. Thank you for coming. I respect your position, but mine deals with a final decision, whether we all like it or not, where there may be some need for identification and privacy law. Which is fine. Thank you. Mr. Pete Peterson. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Goss, forgive me. No, I, I'm sorry I came in late, but I did get briefed on what you're trying to do, and I That's understand good. you want the IRS to oversee this? <laughs> thank you very much. I want a dual-purpose card. <laughs> I thank you for Mr. Peterson. receiving a testimony. You're welcome. Mr. Mr. Goss, have you voted? I have voted, Mr. Chairman. Would you mind awfully chairing this session in our absence and listen to Mr. Peterson? Forgive us, Pete, but we only have a minute. Yeah, this is exciting. Everybody leaves as soon as I get here. I don't know what I'm talking about. This is an omen. Well, what, what they have cl clearly done is they wanted to make sure that you got the fairest possible treatment here. Well, this is going to be fair. Obviously, you and I share a lot in common on this. Uh, indeed, we do. Border, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here. Uh, everybody's testified on uh, health care. Uh, proposals in a, in, a, in a macro sense. Uh, what I want to talk about is something that I think has been uh, lacking in a lot of these bills, and that is the long-term care uh, aspect of that. Uh, my uh, testimony is, is really in two parts, because I have two amendments. Uh, the first amendment is on to Mr. Gephardt's uh, proposal, uh, I guess as a substitute to the Clinton bill. and. Uh, uh, I will proceed with that testimony. Uh, and following that, I want to talk about a uh, second amendment that I want to put on uh, and have for consideration for the uh, bipartisan bill, uh, as that has a little different aspect to it. Well, Mr. Chairman and uh, I, uh, members of the committee, uh, for all of you here, uh, thank you for allowing me to come before you today. I fully realize the magnitude of the task facing the committee as you determine the parameters uh, of the debate for which the most important piece of legislation to come before the Congress in the last 60 years. I'd like to speak briefly on the major aim of perfecting amendment, uh, amendments in this case, that I would like to offer pertaining to the issue that is extremely important to me and one that I treat with great seriousness, and that is the long-term care. My amendment will means test the home and community uh, based long-term care program created by Title 10, sub, uh, Title A of the leadership bill. Although means testing is a subject that makes many legislators uneasy, my amendment will ensure that the limited federal funds that are available for long-term care go to those who need them most, those people who can't afford to pay for their own long-term care. By means testing the new home and community-based program at 240 percent of poverty, my amendment allows beneficiaries to receive a complete range of home care services. The leadership bill does not contain an increase in program funding from that which was contained in the original Ways and Means Committee bill. However, the home and community-based program proposed remains woefully underfunded, resulting in re, uh, reduced quality of care for all, that is, all beneficiaries. The question for members of Congress is, should we guarantee a comprehensive array of long-term home and community-based benefits for those who cannot afford to pay for it themselves? Or should we create a drastically underfunded program that results in reduced benefits for those same people because funding that could be used to help them is instead diverted to wealthy and upper income persons who already have the resources to pay for their own long-term care needs? Just as importantly, beginning in 19, correction, 2005, 
this amendment will combine the institutional and home and community-based programs, folding them in under one tent to better synchronize the two public long-term care programs. This is an essential step in the providing disabled Americans the highest quality and most cost-effective long-term care available. To close, Mr. Chairman, I offer this amendment, which is budget neutral, as in the case of the Mr. Gephardt substitute, as a constructive improvement to the leadership bill. I am personally committed to long to health care reform in a general sense and want that that reform to contain the strongest long-term care program possible given our fiscal constraints. Uh, as I said, uh, I have a second uh, amendment, which is somewhat larger, that is uh, virtually the same as the one I prepared for the leadership or uh, Mr. Gephardt's bill. But in this case, uh, we have to add a funding mechanism because in here we're using the existing funding mechanism that was provide, provided by Mr. Gephardt, which was essentially the Ways and Means approach. In the case of the bipartisan bill, uh, there isn't adequate funding. And frankly, that's the failure of that bill, uh, in my view. And I'm funding that with a 24 cent uh, tobacco tax, which will be phased in over three years, 888. Uh, this is something that has been widely acclaimed as, uh, even within the tobacco industry, as something we can do. It's also a uh, use of a uh, funding mechanism for a very specific purpose, one that most Americans agree is, is sadly neglected uh, throughout the United States, and certainly, as you know, Mr. Chairman, in your role uh, coming from uh, your hometown, actually, uh, long-term care is becoming a very, very significantly uh, area of interest for our constituencies. And so these two, these two amendments, I would ask very much that they be placed uh, in order, uh, that we at least have the opportunity to talk about the long-term care failures, uh, I should say the, the uh, lack of long-term care adequacies, in all of the bills that are being presented to the House Representatives. And with that, I'll take whatever questions that you might have. Thank you, sir. Mr. Goss? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Pete, I thank you very much. You've hit on a subject that's extremely important, and frankly, we have not had much discussion on up here, so you have really uh, hit a chord. Um, I'm not as familiar with the Gebhardt bill as you are, uh, but uh, I gather what you're doing is shifting, putting a means test in so that those with the greatest need are going to get the benefits as opposed to those who are subject to means testing and they can afford to take care of themselves. Is that the that's, idea? That's correct. And, and I'm also concerned with, with their uh, underfunding, actually, of, right. of the overall plan. But clearly, it's taking the monies that are there. Uh, in his case, I'm not trying to add more funding. To right, that. I'm I understand. Staying that. within his his uh, budget program, and I'm using it on a means testing basis to make sure that the right people get that money. Uh, it sounds to me like a very good idea and a very good amendment. As I said, I'm not particularly familiar with the whole title, but um, we have means testing in a bipartisan bill, and we've had votes on means testing, which I have supported uh, in on Congress on budget matters. And uh, I think the time has come for us to, to address that issue. So it sounds to me like not only is it a, a welcome amendment, um, but it sounds to me like it's a welcome amendment and a subject that really needs attention, which is long-term care, uh, and particularly with the new statistics we've got on the costs of potential savings for home care if we do it right, and the fact that that's the preference uh, for three, of, three out of four Americans, apparently, um, who are faced with these kinds of decisions. Uh, it seems to me that that's the right way to go. On your other um, amendment on the bipartisan bill, I've got to tell you that uh, I, I frankly welcome that amendment very much uh, and will fight for it because that was an area where we did not have the money. We simply ran out of money uh, in that bill, as you know, putting it together. Exactly. And uh, we did not want, we wanted to be able to say that that was an approach that had no new taxes in it. So we just, we used up what was available and there wasn't any more. And uh, long term did come out. Uh, as, as uh, one of the areas that got uh, satis less than satisfactory attention, in my view. Uh, that was an area where I had to yield. I happen to think your, your uh, amendment makes sense. I think your source of revenue is fine. Uh, and if we can get that amendment on the floor, I suspect I will be able to vote for it. I appreciate that. And I know you have been a very strong proponent of long-term care for a long time, uh, Porter. And that, uh, I think it would be a terrible mistake 
if we allowed uh, the long t the uh, health care uh, reform debate to take place without going into the detail associated with long-term care. Because I agree. this is a sleeping giant. Yes, here. it is. And it's going to uh, be a, a, a significant impact to all of the states, not just Florida, not just the Sun Belt. And I think it's an opportunity to do that with the general debate process. I thank you. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think, frankly, this has been one of the more instructive pieces of of dialogue, even though there weren't uh, all of us here, uh, I, I will make sure that our colleagues get a chance to know about this. I appreciate that. I, I too. I, I like both your amendments very much, and we appreciate very much your coming up here and telling us about them. I appreciate it, Mr. Chairman. These uh, amendments aren't. Uh, we just got them off. We got out time of the to press fix things just up. an hour ago, I think. So they'll be coming to you as quickly as so we can get them. There's plenty of time. Thank we you. Thank you time. very much. And in the absence of any additional witnesses today, we're adjourned until further call of the chair. And apparently we, we are meeting at 11 o'clock in the morning on other business, also on health care. The House Rules Committee met Tuesday to work out how various health care bills will be handled once they get to the House floor. Each bill debated in the House has to have a rule which establishes the parameters for debate. You can again see this program around 3.35 Eastern Time on our companion network, C-SPAN 2. The first of seven live, unedited reenactments of the Lincoln-Douglas debates takes place Saturday afternoon in Ottawa, Illinois.